widely interpreted as requiring a wholesale referral of cases to OIG. In reality, OIG investigates only a small fraction of them and often sits on cases for longer than the five-day window specified in the directive. Meanwhile, the other agencies wait in limbo to execute their duties. Sasam. The Office of the Citizenship and Immigration Services Ombudsman should be eliminated. The DHS bureaucracy is too large, and the Secretary has too many direct reports. Sasam's policy functions can be performed, and sometimes already are, by OIG and GAO. The specialized case work can be moved into USCIs as a special unit, much like the IRS taxpayer advocate. This would require a statutory change to Section 452 of the Homeland Security Act of 2002.20. If SISOM continues as a DHS component, a policy should be issued that prohibits SISOM from assisting illegal aliens to obtain benefits. Currently, approximately 15%-20% of SISOM's workload consists of helping DACA applicants obtain and renew benefits, including work authorization. This is not the role of an ombudsman. In addition, the government should be a neutral adjudicator, not an advocate for illegal aliens. Agency Relationships It is critical to the achievement of the President's policy objectives that all agencies and departments touching immigration policy work in sync with one another. While there are numerous areas in which such cooperation is critical, immigration has proven to be the most difficult. Accordingly, several objectives will be necessary for each of the following departments. L. Department of Health and Human Services, agree to move the Office of Refugee Resettlement, or, to DHS or, alternatively, implement an aggressive and regular effort by the Secretary of HHS to ensure that OR is fully pursuing presidential objectives in support of DHS. L. Department of Defense, assist in aggressively building the border wall system on America's southern border. Additionally, explicitly acknowledge and adjust personnel and priorities to participate actively in the defense of America's borders, including using military personnel and hardware to prevent illegal crossings between ports of entry and channel all cross-border traffic to legal ports of entry. L. Department of Justice, agree to move the Executive Office for Immigration Review and the Office of Immigration Litigation to DHS and slash or, alternatively, to treat the administrative law judges, Immigration Judges and Board of Immigration Appeals, as national security personnel, decertify their union, and move to increase hiring significantly to enable the processing of more immigration cases. L. Department of State, allow DHS to lead international engagement in the Western Hemisphere on issues of security and migration. Additionally, quickly and aggressively address recalcitrant countries' failure to accept deportees by imposing stiff sanctions until deportees are in fact accepted for return, not just promised to be taken. L. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Ensure that only U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents utilize or occupy federally subsidized housing. L. Department of Education, deny loan access to those who are not U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents, and deny loan access to students at schools that provide in-state tuition to illegal aliens. L. Department of Labor, eliminate the two, of four, lowest wage levels for foreign workers. L. Department of the Treasury, implement all necessary regulations both to equalize taxes between American citizens and working visa holders and to provide DHS with all tax information of illegal aliens as expeditiously as possible. L. Intelligence Community, cooperate in the shrinking or elimination of the INA role in the IC while replacing it with CBP and she representation to the IC. Authors note, I had the honor of coordinating the efforts of the experts listed as contributors to this book, nearly all of whom have spent more time inside or interacting with the Department of Homeland Security than myself. I wrote only a small portion of the chapter and relied on the contributor's experience and expertise to give the chapter both its depth and policy impact. No views expressed herein should be attributed to any single contributor. End notes. 1 HR 5005, Homeland Security Act of 2002, Public Law No. 107-296, 107th Congress, November 25, 2002, 101, B, 1. HTTPS slash slash www.congress.gov slash 107 slash PLA slash PUBL 296 slash PLAW 107 PUBL 296 dot PDF, accessed March 14, 2023. 2C, for example, Elon Musk slams CISA censorship network as propaganda platform, Canico News, December 28, 2022. HTTPS slash slash Canico.substack.com slash P slash Elon Musk slams CISA censorship network. Accessed March 14, 2023. 3HR 2680, an act to amend the Immigration and Nationality Act, and for other purposes, Public Law No. 89-236, 89th Congress, October 3, 1965, https slash www.govinfo.gov slash content slash package slash statute 79 slash pdf slash statute 79 pg 911 pdf, accessed March 14, 2023. 4 added to the Immigration and Nationality Act by the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. 
CHR 3610, Omnibus Consolidated Appropriations Act, 1997, Public Law No. 104-208, 104th Congress, September 30, 1996, Division C, HTTPS slash slash www.congress.gov slash 104 slash plus slash PUBL 208 slash PLAW 104 PUBL 208.pdf, accessed March 14, 2023. 58 U.S. Code, HTTPS slash slash www.law.cornell.edu slash S code slash text slash 8, accessed March 14, 2023. 618 U.S. Code, HTTPS slash slash www.law.cornell.edu slash s code slash text slash 18, accessed March 14, 2023. 75 U.S. Code 551 559, HTTPS slash slash www.law.cornell.edu slash s code slash text slash 5 slash part i slash chapter 5 slash subchapter 2, accessed March 14, 2023. 8 Table United States Citizenship and Immigration Services Budget Comparison and Adjustments Appropriation and PPA Summary, in U.S. Department of Homeland Security, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, Department of Homeland Security, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, Budget Overview, Fiscal Year 2023 Congressional Justification, Pieces 4, HTTPS slash slash www.uscis.gov slash sites slash default slash file slash document slash report slash u.s underscore citizenship underscore and underscore immigration underscore services percent e2 percent 80 percent 99 underscore budget underscore overview underscore document underscore 4 percent 20 fiscal underscore year underscore 2023 dot pdf number colon text equals the percent 25 percent 202023 percent 20 budget percent 20 includes percent 20 percent 24913.6 m percent 2c percent 204 percent 2c001 percent 20 positions percent 3b of percent 20 percent 24444.1 m percent 20 above percent 20 the percent 25 percent 202022 percent 20 president percent e2 percent 80 percent 99 s percent 20 budget, accessed March 14, 2023, and table, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services Comparison of Budget Authority and Request, in IBID, Pieces 5. 9 H.R. 7311, William Wilberforce Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008, Public Law No. 110-457, 110th Congress, December 23, 2008, 235. HTTPS slash slash www.congress.gov slash 110 slash plus slash PUBL 457 slash PLAW 110 PUBL 457 PDF, accessed March 15, 2023. 10 Matter of AB, Respondent, 27 IN and December 316, AG 2018. HTTPS slash slash www.justice.gov slash EOI or slash page slash file slash 1070866 slash download. Access January 18, 2023. 11 Arizona v. United States, 567 U.S. 387, 2012, https slash slash supreme.justia.com slash cases slash federal slash us slash 567 slash 387 slash, access January 18, 2023. 12 Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act Public Law 93288. Approved May 22, 1974 as amended through PL 117328, enacted December 29, 2022, HTTPS slash slash www.govinfo.gov slash content slash package slash comps 2977 slash pdf slash comps 2977.pdf, accessed March 15, 2023. 13 U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency, Department of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency, Budget Overview, Fiscal Year 2023 Congressional Justification, P. FEMA 24, HTTPS slash slash www.dhs.gov slash site slash default slash file slash 2022-03 slash federal percent 20 emergency percent 20 management percent 20 agency underscore remediated dot pdf, accessed March 15, 2023. 14 Report, United States Secret Service, an agency in crisis, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, U.S. House of Representatives. 114th Congress, December 9, 2015, https slash slash republicans oversight.house.gov slash wp content slash upload slash 2015 slash 12 slash oversight USSS report pdf, access January 18, 2023. 15 5 US Code 7103. HTTPS slash slash www.law.cornell.edu slash s code slash text slash 5 slash 7103, accessed March 15, 2023. 16 S. 3418, Privacy Act of 1974, Public Law No. 93 579, 
93rd Congress, December 31, 1974, https slash content slash package slash statute 88 slash pdf slash statute 88 pg 1896 pdf, accessed March 15, 2023. 17 H.R. 1428, Judicial Redress Act of 2015, Public Law No. 114 to 126, 114 Congress, February 24, 2016, https slash slash www.congress.gov slash 114 slash pla slash publ 126 slash plaw 114 publ 126.pdf, accessed March 15, 2023. 18 H.R. 1158, Consolidated Appropriations Act, 2020, Public Law No. 116-93, 116th Congress, December 20, 2019, HTTPS slash slash www.congress.gov slash bill slash 116th Congress slash House Bill slash 1158, accessed January 18, 2023. 19 U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Office of Inspector General, Management Directive No. 0810.1, June 10, 2004. HTTPS slash slash www.dhs.gov slash library slash assets slash FOIA slash management underscore directive underscore 0810 underscore one underscore the underscore office underscore of underscore inspector underscore general dot PDF, accessed March 15th, 2023. 20 HR 5005, Homeland Security Act of 2002, Public Law No. 107 to 296, 107th Congress, November 25th, 2002. HTTPS slash slash www.congress.gov slash bill slash 107th Congress slash House Bill slash 5005, accessed January 18th, 2023. Warning, empty page. 6. Department of State. Kyron K. Skinner. The U.S. Department of State's mission is to bilaterally, multilaterally, and regionally implement the President's foreign policy priorities, to serve U.S. citizens abroad, and to advance the economic, foreign policy, and national security interests of the United States. Since the U.S. founding, the Department of State has been the American government's designated tool of engagement with foreign governments and peoples throughout the world. Country names, borders, leaders, technology, and people have changed in the more than two centuries since the founding, but the basics of diplomacy remain the same. Although the department has also evolved throughout the years, at least in the modern era, there is one significant problem that the next president must address to be successful. There are scores of fine diplomats who serve the president's agenda often helping to shape and interpret that agenda. At the same time, however, in all administrations, there is a tug-of-war between presidents and bureaucracies and that resistance is much starker under conservative presidents, due largely to the fact that large swaths of the State Department's workforce are left-wing and predisposed to disagree with a conservative president's policy agenda and vision. It should not and cannot be this way, the American people need and deserve a diplomatic machine fully focused on the national interest as defined through the election of a president who sets the domestic and international agenda for the nation. The next administration must take swift and decisive steps to reforge the department into a lean and functional diplomatic machine that serves the President and, thereby, the American people. Below is the basic but essential roadmap for achieving these repairs. History and Context Founded in 1789, the Department of State was one of the first cabinet-level agencies in the new American government. The first Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, oversaw a small staff, diplomatic posts in London and Paris, and ten consular. Posts.1 Today, the Department of State has almost 80,000 total employees, including 13,517 Foreign Service employees and 11,683 Civil Service employees, in 275 embassies, consulates, and other posts around the world.2 In theory, the State Department is the principal agency responsible for carrying out the President's foreign policy and representing the United States and other nations and international organizations. To the extent consistent with presidential policy and federal law, the department also supports U.S. citizens and businesses in other nations and vets foreign nationals seeking temporary or permanent entrance to the United States. The State Department also provides humanitarian, security, and other assistance to non-U.S. populations in need, and otherwise advances and supports U.S. national interests abroad. Properly led, the State Department can be instrumental for communicating and implementing a foreign policy vision that best serves American citizens. As the U.S. Commission on National Security-21 ST Century, the Hart Rudman Commission, Observed more than 20 years ago, the State Department is a crippled institution suffering from an ineffective organizational structure in which regional and functional policies do not serve integrated goals, and in which sound management, accountability, and leadership are lacking. Three, unfortunately, this critique remains accurate. The State Department's failures are not due to a lack of resources. As one expert has observed, 
the department has significantly more at its disposal than was the case at the end of the Cold War, in the mid-1990s, and at the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars for a major source, if not the major source, of the State Department's ineffectiveness lies in its institutional belief that it is an independent institution that knows what is best for the United States, sets its own foreign policy, and does not need direction from an elected president. The next president can make the State Department more effective by providing a clear foreign policy vision, selecting political officials and career diplomats that will enthusiastically turn that vision into a policy agenda, and firmly supporting the State Department as it makes the necessary institutional adjustments. Political Leadership and Bureaucratic Leadership and Support Focusing the State Department on the needs and goals of the next president will require the president's hand-picked political leadership as well as foreign service and civil service personnel who share the president's vision and policy agendas to run the department. This can be done by taking these steps at the outset of the next administration. Exert leverage during the confirmation process. Notwithstanding the challenges and slowness of the modern U.S. Senate confirmation process, the next president can exert leverage on the Senate if he or she is willing to place State Department appointees directly into those roles, pending confirmation. Doing so would both ensure that the department has immediate senior political leadership and would force the Senate to act on nominees' appointments instead of being allowed to engage in dilatory tactics that cripple the State Department's functionality. For weeks, months, or even years. Assert leadership in the appointment process. The next administration should assert leadership over, and guidance to, the State Department by placing political appointees in positions that do not require Senate confirmation, including senior advisors, principal deputy assistant secretaries, and deputy assistant secretaries. Given the department's size, the next administration should also increase the number of political appointees to manage it. To the extent possible, all non-confirmed senior appointees should be selected by the president-elect's transition team or the new president's office of presidential personnel, depending on the timing of selection, and be in place the first day of the administration. No one in a leadership position on the morning of January 20 should hold that position at the end of the day. These recommendations do not imply that foreign service and civil service officials should be excluded from key roles it is hard to imagine a scenario in which they are not immediately relevant to the transition of power. The main suggestion here is that as many political appointees as possible should be in place at the start of a new administration. Support and train political appointees. The Secretary of State should use his or her office and its resources to ensure regular coordination among all political appointees, which should take the form of strategy meetings, trainings, and other events. The Secretary should also take reasonable steps to ensure that the State Department's political appointees are connected to other departments' political appointees which is critical for cross-agency effectiveness and morale. The Secretary should capitalize on the more experienced political appointees by using them as the foundation for a mentorship program for less experienced political appointees. The interaction of political appointees must be routine and operational rather than incidental or occasional, and it must be treated as a crucial dimension for the next administration's success. Maximize the value of career officials. Career foreign service and civil service personnel can and must be leveraged for their expertise and commitment to the President's mission. Indeed, the State Department has thousands of employees with unparalleled linguistic, cultural, policy, and administrative skills. And large numbers of them have been an enormous resource to the secretaries of state under which they have served. The secretary must find a way to make clear to career officials that despite prior history and modes of operation, they need not be adversaries of a conservative president, secretary of state, or the team of political appointees. Reboot Ambassadors Worldwide All ambassadors are required to submit letters of resignation at the start of a new administration. Previous Republican administrations have accepted the resignations of only the political ambassadors and allowed the Foreign Service ambassadors to retain their posts, sometimes for months or years into a new administration. Point five, the next administration must go further, it should both accept the resignations of all political ambassadors and quickly review and reassess all career ambassadors. This review should commence well before the new administration's first day. Ambassadors in countries where U.S. policy or posture would substantially change under the new administration, as well as any who have evinced hostility toward the incoming administration or its agenda should be recalled immediately. The priority should be to put in place new ambassadors who support the President's agenda among political appointees, foreign service officers, and civil service personnel, with no predetermined percentage among these categories. Political ambassadors with strong personal relationships with the President should be prioritized. For key strategic posts such as Australia, Japan, the United Kingdom, the United Nations, and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Riding the ship. Ensuring the State Department is accountable for serving American citizens. First will require at a minimum that the following steps be implemented immediately. Review retroactively. Before inauguration, the President-elect's Department Transition Team should assess every aspect of State Department negotiations and funding commitments. Upon inauguration, the Secretary of State should order an immediate freeze on all efforts to implement unratified treaties and international agreements, allocation of resources, foreign assistance disbursements, 
domestic and international contracts and payments, hiring and recruiting decisions, etc., pending a political appointee-driven review to ensure that such efforts comport with the new administration's policies. The quality of this review is more important than speed. The posture of the department during this review should be an unwavering desire to prioritize the American people including a recognition that the federal government must be a diligent steward of taxpayer dollars. Implement repair. The State Department must change its handling of international agreements to restore constitutional governance. Under prior administrations, unnecessary institutional factors in the department caused numerous logistical challenges in negotiating, approving, and implementing treaties and agreements. This is particularly true under the Biden administration. For example, under the Biden administration, the State Department was considered sufficiently unreliable in terms of alignment and effectiveness such that its political leadership invoked its Circular 175, C-175, authority to delegate its diplomatic capacity to other agencies such as the Department of Homeland Security. At time of publication, the State Department is negotiating, or seeking to negotiate, large-scale, sovereignty-eroding agreements that could come at considerable economic and other costs to the American people. Although such agreements should be evaluated and approved as are treaties, the Biden administration is likely to simply call them agreements. The Biden State Department not only approves but also enforces treaties that have not been ratified by the U.S. Senate. This practice must be thoroughly reviewed and most likely jettisoned. The next president should recalibrate how the State Department handles treaties and agreements, primarily by restoring constitutionality to these processes. He or she should direct the Secretary of State to freeze any ongoing treaty or international agreement negotiations and assess whether those efforts align with the new president's foreign policy direction. The next administration should also direct the Secretary to order an immediate stand-down on enforcement of any treaties that have not been ratified by the Senate and order a thorough review of the degree to which such enforcement has impacted the department's functions, policies, and use of resources. The Secretary of State, in cooperation with the Office of the Attorney General and the White House Counsel's Office, should also conduct a review to identify agreements that are really treaty commitments within the ordinary public meaning of the Constitution 6 and suspend compliance pending presidential transmittal of those agreements to the Senate for advice and consent. The next administration should also move to withdraw from treaties that have been under Senate consideration for 20 years or more with the understanding that those treaties are unlikely to be ratified. Under circumstances in which ratification of a stale treaty before the Senate still serves national interests, the Treaty Letter of Transmittal and Submission should be updated for current circumstances. The Secretary of State must revoke most outstanding C-175 authorities that have been granted to other agencies. During previous administrations, although such revocations should be closely coordinated with the White House for logistical reasons, coordinate with other agencies. Interagency engagement in this new environment must be similarly adjusted to mirror presidential direction. Indeed, coordination among federal agencies is challenging even in the most well-oiled administrations. Although such coordination is inescapable and sometimes productive, agencies tend to leverage each other's resources in ways that occasionally have off-mission consequences for the agency or agencies with the resources. Ideally, they Secretary of State should work as part of an agile foreign policy team along with the National Security Advisor, the Secretary of Defense, and other agency heads to flesh out and advance the president's foreign policy. Bureaucratic stovepipes of the past should be less important than commitment to, and achievement of, the president's foreign policy agenda. The State Department's role in these interagency discussions must reflect the president's clear direction and disallow resources and tools to be used in any way that detracts from the presidentially directed mission. Coordinate with Congress. Congress has both the statutory and appropriations authority to impact the State Department's operations and has a strong interest in key aspects of American foreign policy. The department must therefore take particular care in its interaction with Congress, since poor interactions with Congress, regardless of intentions, could trigger congressional pushback or have other negative impacts on the president's agenda. This will require particularly strong leadership of the Department of State's Bureau of Legislative Affairs. The Secretary of State and political leadership should ensure full coordination with the White House regarding congressional engagement on any State Department responsibility. This may lead to, for example, the President authorizing the State Department to engage with members of Congress and relevant committees on certain issues, including statutorily designated congressional consultations, but to remain radio silent on volatile or designated issues on which the White House wants to be the primary or only voice. All such authorized department engagements with Congress must be driven and handled by political appointees in conjunction with career officials who have the relevant expertise and are willing to work in concert with the President's political appointees on particularly sensitive matters. Respond vigorously to the Chinese threat. The State Department recently opened the Office of China Coordination, or China House. This office is intended to bring together experts inside and outside the State Department to coordinate U.S. government relations with China and advance our vision for an open, inclusive, international system. 
7. Whether China House will streamline U.S. government communication, consensus, and action on China policy given the presence of other agencies with strong competing or adverse interests remains to be seen. The unit is dependent on adequate and competent staff being assigned by other bureaus within the State Department. Nonetheless, the concept is one a Republican administration should support mutatis mutandis. The Chinese Communist Party, CCP, has been at war with the U.S. for decades. Now that this reality has been accepted throughout the government, the State Department must be prepared to lead the U.S. diplomatic effort accordingly. The centralization of efforts in one place is critical to this end. Review Immigration and Domestic Security Requirements Arguably, the Department's most noteworthy challenge on the global stage has been its handling of immigration and domestic security issues, which are inextricably related. The State Department's apparent posture toward these two issues, which are of paramount importance to the American people, has historically been that they are of lesser importance than other issues and that they can be treated as concessions in broader diplomatic engagements. In other instances in which access to the U.S. in the form of immigrant, permanent, and non-immigrant, temporary, visas could potentially serve as diplomatic leverage, it is almost never used. To some degree, the State Department and many of its personnel appear to view the U.S. immigration system less as a tool for strengthening the United States and more as a global welfare program. To ensure the safety, security, and prosperity of all Americans, this must change. Below are several key areas in which the department's formal and informal postures must adjust to reflect the current immigration and domestic security environment. L. Visa Reciprocity The United States should strictly enforce the doctrine of reciprocity when issuing visas to all foreign nationals. For too long, the U.S. has provided virtually unfettered access to foreign nationals from countries that do not respond in kind including countries that are actively hostile to U.S. interests and nationals. Mandatory reciprocity will convey the necessary reality that other countries do not have an unfettered right to U.S. access and must reciprocally offer favorable visa-based access to U.S. nationals. The State Department's reaction time to other countries' changes in visa policies with respect to the U.S. must be streamlined to ensure it can be updated in real time. L. Section 243, D. Visa Sanctions Visa Sanctions under Section 243, D. of the Immigration and Nationality Act, INA. 8 enacted into law to motivate countries to accept the return of any nationals who have been ordered removed from the U.S., should be quickly and fully enforced. Recalcitrant countries that do not accept receipt of their returned nationals will risk the suspension of issuance of all immigrant visas, all non-immigrant visas, or all visas. These country-specific sanctions should remain in place until the sanctioned country accepts the return of all its removal pending nationals and formally commits to future, regular acceptance of its nationals. Black letter implementation of this law will demonstrate a heretofore lacking seriousness to the international community that other nations must respect U.S. immigration laws and work with federal authorities to accept returning nationals or lose access to the United States. L. Rightsizing Refugee Admissions The Biden administration has engineered what is nothing short of a collapse of U.S. border security and interior immigration enforcement. This administration's humanitarian crisis which is arguably the greatest humanitarian crisis in the modern era, one which has harmed Americans and foreign nationals alike will take many years and billions of dollars to fully address. One casualty of the Biden administration's behavior will be the current form of the U.S. Refugee Admission Program, USRAP. The federal government's obligation to shift national security essential screening and vetting resources to the forged border crisis will necessitate an indefinite curtailment of the number of USRAP refugee admissions. The State Department's Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration, which administers USRAP, must shift its resources to challenges stemming from the current immigration situation until the crisis can be contained and refugee-focused screening and vetting capacity can reasonably be restored. L. Strengthening bilateral and multilateral immigration-focused agreements. Restoration of both domestic security and the integrity of the U.S. immigration system should start with rapid reactivation of several key initiatives in effect at the conclusion of the Trump administration. Re-implementation of the Remain in Mexico policy, safe third country agreements, and other measures to address the influx of non-Mexican asylum applicants at the United States-Mexico border must be day one priorities. Although the State Department must reign in the C-175 authorities of other agencies, the Department of Homeland Security should retain, or regain, C-175 authorities for negotiating bilateral and multilateral security agreements. L. Evaluation of National Security Vulnerable Visa Programs To protect the American people, the State Department, in coordination with the White House and other security-focused agencies, should evaluate several key security-sensitive visa programs that it manages. Key programs include, but should not be limited to, the Diversity Visa Program, the F, Student, Visa Program, and J, Exchange Visitor, Visa Program. The State Department's evaluation must ensure that these programs are not only consistent with White House immigration policy, but also align with its national security obligations and resource limitations. Pivoting abroad. Personnel and management adjustments are crucial preludes to refocus the State Department's mission, which is implementing the President's foreign policy agenda and, in so doing, ensuring that the interests of American citizens are given 
priority. That said, the next president must significantly reorient the U.S. government's posture toward friends and adversaries alike which will include much more honest assessments about who are friends and who are not. This reorientation could represent the most significant shift in core foreign policy principles and corresponding action since the end of the Cold War. Although not every country or issue area can be discussed in this chapter, below are examples of several areas in which a shift in U.S. foreign policy is not only important, but arguably existential. The point is not to assert that everyone in the evolving conservative movement, or, in some cases, the growing bipartisan consensus, will agree with the details of this assessment. Rather, what is presented below demonstrates the urgency of these issues and provides a general roadmap for analysis. In a world on fire, a handful of nations require heightened attention. Some represent existential threats to the safety and security of the American people, others threaten to hurt the U.S. economy, and others are wild cards, whose full threat scope is unknown but nevertheless unsettling. The five countries on which the next administration should focus its attention and energy are China, Iran, Venezuela, Russia, and North Korea. The People's Republic of China The designs of the People's Republic of China, PRC, and the Chinese Communist Party, which runs the PRC, are serious and dangerous. Point nine. This tyrannical country with a population of more than 1 billion people has the vision, resources, and patience to achieve its objectives. Protecting the United States from the PRC's designs requires an unambiguous offensive-defensive mix, including protecting American citizens and their interests, as well as U.S. allies, from PRC attacks and abuse that undermine U.S. competitiveness, security, and prosperity. The United States must have a cost-imposing strategic response to make Beijing's aggression unaffordable, even as the American economy and U.S. power grow. This stance will require real, sustained, near-unprecedented U.S. growth, stronger partnerships, synchronized economic and security policies, and American energy independence but above all, it will require a very honest perspective about the nature and designs of the PRC as more of a threat than a competitor. Point 10 The next president should use the State Department and its array of resources to reassess and lead this effort, just as it did during the Cold War. The U.S. government needs an Article X for China 11 and it should be a presidential mandate. Along with the National Security Council, the State Department should draft an Article X, which should be a deeply philosophical look at the China challenge. Many foreign policy professionals and national leaders, both in government and the private sector, are reluctant to take decisive action regarding China. Many are vested in an unshakable faith in the international system and global norms. They are so enamored with them they cannot brook any criticisms or reforms, let alone acknowledge their potential for being abused by the PRC. Others refuse to acknowledge. Beijing's malign activities and often pass off criticism as conspiracy theories. For instance, many were quick to dismiss even the possibility that COVID-19 escaped from a Chinese research laboratory. The reality, however, is that the PRC's actions often do sound like conspiracy theories because they are conspiracies. In addition, some knowingly or not parrot the communist line, global leaders including President Joe Biden, have tried to normalize or even log Chinese behavior. In some cases, these voices, like the global corporate giants BlackRock and Disney, directly benefit from doing business with Beijing. On the other hand, others acknowledge the dangers posed by the PRC, but believe in a moderating approach to accommodate its rise, a policy of compete where we must, but cooperate where we can, including on issues like climate change. This strategy has demonstrably failed. As with all global struggles with communist and other tyrannical regimes, the issue should never be with the Chinese people but with the communist dictatorship. That oppresses them and threatens the well-being of nations across the globe. Point 12 That said, the nature of Chinese power today is the product of history, ideology and the institutions that have governed China during the course of five millennia, inherited by the present Chinese leaders from the preceding generations of the CCP. Point 13 In short, the PRC challenge is rooted in China's strategic culture and not just the Marxism-Leninism of the CCP, meaning that internal culture and civil society will never deliver a more normative nation. The PRC's aggressive behavior can only be curbed through external pressure. The Islamic Republic of Iran The ongoing protests in the Islamic Republic of Iran, Iran, which are widely viewed as a new revolution, have shown that the Islamic regime, which has been in power since 1979 when Ayatollah Khomeini became the leader, is at its weakest state in its history and is at odds not only with its own people but also its regional neighbors. Iran is home to a proud and ancient culture, yet its people have struggled to achieve democracy and have had to endure a hostile theocratic regime that vehemently opposes freedom. The time may be right to press harder on the Iranian theocracy, support the Iranian people, and take other steps to draw Iran into the community of free and modern nations. Unfortunately, the Obama and Biden administrations have propped up the brutal Islamist theocracy that has hurt the Iranian people and threatened nuclear war. For example, the Obama administration's 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, commonly referred to as the Iran Nuclear Deal, gave the Islamic regime a crucial monetary lifeline after the Green Movement protests in 2009, 
which, while ultimately unsuccessful, did succeed in weakening the regime and showing the world that younger Iranians want freedom. Instead of pressuring the Iranian theocracy to move toward democracy, the Obama administration threw the brutal regime an economic lifeline by giving hundreds of billions of dollars to the Iranian government and providing other sanctions. Relief This economic relief did not moderate the regime, but emboldened its brutality, its efforts to expand its nuclear weapons programs, and its support for global terrorism. Former President Obama has admitted his lack of support for the Green Movement during his administration was an error and blamed it on poor advisors yet those same advisors are involved with the Biden administration's insistence on reducing pressure on the theocracy and resurrecting a nuclear deal. The next administration should neither preserve nor repeat the mistakes of the Obama and Biden administrations. The correct future policy for Iran is one that acknowledges that it is in U.S. national security interests, the Iranian people's human rights interests, and a broader global interest in peace and stability for the Iranian people to have the democratic government they demand. This decision to be free of the country's abusive leaders must of course be made by the Iranian people, but the United States can utilize its own and others' economic and diplomatic tools to ease the path toward a free Iran and a renewed relationship with the Iranian people. The Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela Once a model of democracy and a true U.S. ally, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Venezuela, has all but collapsed under the communist regimes of the late Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. In the 24 years since Hugo Chavez was first elected Venezuelan president in 1999, the country has violently cracked down on pro-democracy citizens and organizations, shattered its once oil-rich economy, empowered domestic criminal cartels, and helped fuel a hemispheric refugee crisis. Venezuela has swung from being one of the most prosperous, if not the most prosperous, country in South America to being one of the poorest. Its communist leadership has also drawn closer to some of the United States' greatest international foes, including the PRC and Iran, which have long sought a foothold in the Americas. Indeed, Venezuela serves as a reminder of just how fragile democratic institutions that are not maintained can be. To contain Venezuela's communism and aid international partners, the next administration must take important steps to put Venezuela's communist abusers on notice while making strides to help the Venezuelan people. The next administration must work to unite the hemisphere against this significant but underestimated threat in the southern hemisphere. Russia One issue today that starkly divides conservatives is the Russia-Ukraine conflict. The common ground seems to be recognition that presidential leadership in 2025 must chart the course. L1 School of Conservative Thought holds that as Moscow's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine drags on, Russia presents major challenges to U.S. interests, as well as to peace, stability, and the post-Cold War security order in Europe. This viewpoint argues for continued U.S. involvement including military aid, economic aid, and the presence of NATO and U.S. troops if necessary. The end goal of the conflict must be the defeat of Russian President Vladimir Putin and a return to pre-invasion border lines. L. Another school of conservative thought denies that U.S.-Ukrainian support is in the national security interest of America at all. Ukraine is not a member of the NATO alliance and is one of the most corrupt nations in the region. European nations directly affected by the conflict should aid in the defense of Ukraine, but the U.S. should not continue its involvement. This viewpoint desires a swift end to the conflict through a negotiated settlement between Ukraine and Russia. L. The tension between these competing positions has given rise to a third approach. This conservative viewpoint eschews both isolationism and interventionism. Rather, each foreign policy decision must first ask the question, what is in the interest of the American people? U.S. military engagement must clearly fall within U.S. interests, be fiscally responsible, and protect American freedom, liberty, and sovereignty, all while recognizing communist China as the greatest threat to U.S. interests. Thus, with respect to Ukraine, continued U.S. involvement must be fully paid for, limited to military aid, while European allies address Ukraine's economic needs, and have a clearly defined national security strategy that does not risk American lives. Regardless of viewpoints, all sides agree that Putin's invasion of Ukraine is unjust and that the Ukrainian people have a right to defend their homeland. Furthermore, the conflict has severely weakened Putin's military strength and provided a boost to NATO unity and its importance to European nations. The next conservative president has a generational opportunity to bring resolution to the foreign policy tensions within the movement and chart a new path forward that recognizes communist China as the defining threat to U.S. interests in the 21st century. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea Peace and stability in Northeast Asia are vital interests of the United States. The Republic of Korea, South Korea, and Japan are critical allies for ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific. They are indispensable military, economic, diplomatic, and technology partners. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, DPRK, or North Korea, must be deterred from military conflict. The United States cannot permit the DPRK to remain a de facto nuclear power with the capacity to threaten the United States or its allies. This interest is both critical to the defense of the American homeland and the future of global nonproliferation. 
the DPRK must not be permitted to profit from its blatant violations of international commitments or to threaten other nations with nuclear blackmail. Both interests can only be served if the U.S. disallows the DPRK's rogue regime behavior. Other International Engagements Western Hemisphere The United States has a vested interest in a relatively united and economically prosperous Western Hemisphere. Nonetheless, the region now has an overwhelming number of socialist or progressive regimes, which are at odds with the freedom and growth-oriented policies of the U.S. and other neighbors and who increasingly pose hemispheric security threats. A new approach is therefore needed, one that simultaneously allows the U.S. to reposture in its best interests and helps regional partners enter a new century of growth and opportunity. The following core policies must be part of this new direction. L.A. Sovereign Mexico Policy Mexico is currently a national security disaster. Bluntly stated, Mexico can no longer qualify as a first world nation, it has functionally lost its sovereignty to muscular criminal cartels that effectively run the country. The current dynamic is not good for either U.S. citizens or Mexicans, and the perfect storm created by this cartel state has negative effects that are damaging the entire hemisphere. The next administration must both adopt a posture that calls for a fully sovereign Mexico and take all steps at its disposal to support that result in as rapid a fashion as possible. L.A. Fentanyl Free Frontier The same cartels that parasitically run Mexico are also working with the PRC to fuel the largest drug crisis in the history of North America. These Mexican cartels are working closely with Chinese fentanyl precursor chemical manufacturers, importing those precursor chemicals into Mexico, manufacturing fentanyl on Mexican soil, and shipping it into the United States and elsewhere. The highly potent narcotic is having an unprecedented lethal impact on the American citizenry. The next administration must leverage its new insistence on a sovereign Mexico and work with other Western Hemisphere partners to halt the fentanyl crisis and put a decisive end to this unprecedented public health threat. LA Hemisphere-Centered Approach to Industry and Energy the next administration has a golden opportunity to make key economic changes that will not only provide tremendous economic opportunities for Americans but will also serve as an economic boon to the entire Western Hemisphere. First, the United States must do everything possible, with both resources and messaging, to shift global manufacturing and industry from more distant points around the globe, especially from the increasingly hostile and human rights abusing PRC, to Central and South American countries. Rehemisphering manufacturing and industry closer to home will not only eliminate some of the more recent supply chain issues that damaged the U.S. economy but will also represent a significant economic improvement for parts of the Americas in need of growth and stabilization. Similarly, the United States must work with Mexico, Canada and other countries to develop a hemisphere-focused energy policy that will reduce reliance on distant and manipulable sources of fossil fuels, restore the free flow of energy among the hemisphere's largest producers, and work together to increase energy production, including for nations that are looking for dramatic economic expansion. LA Local Approach to Security Threats Western Hemisphere nations, including those in the Caribbean, arguably have stronger cultural and historical ties to the United States than most other countries and regions in the world. Yet Central and South America are moving rapidly into the sphere of anti-American, external state actors, including the PRC, Iran, and Russia. Specific countries in the Americas, such as Venezuela, Colombia, Guyana, and Ecuador, are either increasingly regional security threats in their own rights or are vulnerable to hostile extracontinental powers. The U.S. has an opportunity to lead these democratic neighbors to fight against the external pressure of threats from abroad and address local regional security concerns. This leadership and collaboration must span all tools at the disposal of U.S. allies and partners, including security-focused cooperation. Middle East and North Africa The next administration must re-engage with Middle Eastern and North African nations and not abandon the region. Without U.S. leadership, the region may tumble further into chaos or fall prey to American adversaries. This recommendation requires a multi-dimensional strategy. L. First, the U.S. must prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear technology and delivery capabilities and more broadly block Iranian ambitions. This means, inter alia, reinstituting and expanding Trump administration sanctions, providing security assistance for regional partners, supporting, through public diplomacy and otherwise, freedom-seeking Iranian people in their revolt against the mullahs, and ensuring Israel has both the military means and the political support and flexibility to take what it deems to be appropriate measures to defend itself against the Iranian regime and its regional proxies Hamas, Hezbollah, and Palestinian. Islamic Jihad L. Second, the next administration should build on the Trump administration's diplomatic successes by encouraging other Arab states, including Saudi Arabia, to enter the Abraham Accords. Related policies should include reversing, as appropriate, the Biden administration's degradation of the long-standing partnership with Saudi Arabia. The Palestinian Authority should be defunded. A further key priority is keeping Turkey in the Western fold and a NATO ally. This includes a vigorous outreach to Turkey to dissuade it from hedging toward Russia or China, which is likely to require a rethinking of U.S. support for YPG-PKK People's Protection Units-Kurdistan Workers' Party Kurdish Forces, which Ankara believes are an existential threat to its security. 
for the foreseeable future and much longer than one new administration Middle Eastern oil will play a key role in the world economy. Therefore, the US must continue to support its allies and compete with its economic adversaries, including China. Relations with Saudi Arabia should be strengthened in a way that seriously curtails Chinese influence in Riyadh. L. Third, it is in the U.S. national interest to build a Middle East security pact that includes Israel, Egypt, the Gulf states, and potentially India, as a second quad arrangement. Protecting freedom of navigation in the Gulf and in the Red Sea-Suez Canal is vital to the world economy and therefore to U.S. prosperity as well. In North Africa, security cooperation with European allies, especially France, will be vital to limit growing Islamist threats and the incursion of Russian influence through positionings of the Wagner Group. L. The U.S. cannot neglect a concern for human rights and minority rights, which must be balanced with strategic and security considerations. Special attention must be paid to challenges of religious freedom, especially the status of Middle Eastern Christians and other religious minorities, as well as the human trafficking endemic to the region. Sub-Saharan Africa Africa's importance to U.S. foreign policy and strategic interests is rising and will only continue to grow. Its explosive population growth, large reserves of industry-dependent minerals, proximity to key maritime shipping routes, and its collective diplomatic power ensure the continent's global importance. Yet as Africa's strategic significance has grown, the U.S.'s relative influence there has declined. Terrorist activity on the continent has increased, while America's competitors are making significant gains for their own national interests. The PRC's companies dominate the African supply chain for certain minerals critical to emerging technologies. African nations comprise major country bloc elements that shield the PRC and Russia from international isolation for their human rights abuses and African nations staunchly support PRC foreign policy goals on issues such as Hong Kong occupation, South China Sea's dispute arbitration, and Taiwan. The new administration can correct this strategic failing of existing policy by prioritizing Africa and by undertaking fundamental changes in how the United States works with African nations. At a bare minimum, the next administration should L. Shift strategic focus from assistance to growth Reorient the focus of U.S. overseas development assistance away from standalone humanitarian development aid and toward fostering free market systems in African countries by incentivizing and facilitating U.S. private sector engagement in these countries. Development aid alone does little to develop countries and can fuel corruption and violent conflict. While the United States should always be willing to offer emergency and humanitarian relief, both U.S. and African long-term interests are better served by a free market-based, private growth-focused strategy to Africa's economic challenges. L. Counter malign Chinese activity on the continent. This should include the development of powerful public diplomacy efforts to counter Chinese influence campaigns with commitments to freedom of speech and the free flow of information, the creation of a template digital hygiene program that African countries can access to sanitize and protect their sensitive communications networks from espionage by the PRC and other hostile actors, the recognition of Somaliland statehood as a hedge against the U.S.'s deteriorating position in Djibouti, and a Focus on supporting American companies involved in industries important to U.S. national interests or that have a competitive advantage in Africa. L. Counter the furtherance of terrorism. African country-based terrorist groups like Boko Haram may currently lack the capability to attack the United States, but at least some of them would eventually try if allowed to consolidate their operations and plan such attacks. The immediate threat they pose lies in their abilities and willingness to strike American targets in their regions of operation or to harm U.S. interests in other ways. The U.S. should support capable African military and security operations through the State Department and other federal agencies responsible for granting foreign military education, training, and security assistance. L. Build a coalition of the cooperative. Rather than thinning limited federal resources by spreading funds across all countries, including some that are unsupportive or even hostile to the United States, the next administration should focus on those countries with which the U.S. can expect a mutually beneficial relationship. After being designated focus countries by the State Department, such nations should receive a full suite of American engagement. That said, the next administration should still maintain a baseline level of contact even with those countries with which it has less than fruitful relationships in order to encourage positive developments and to be in position to seize unexpected diplomatic opportunities as they arise. L. Focus on core diplomatic activities, and stop promoting policies birthed in the American culture wars. African nations are particularly, and reasonably, non-receptive to the U.S. social policies such as abortion and pro-LGBT initiatives being imposed on them. The United States should focus on core security, economic, and human rights engagement with African partners and reject the promotion of divisive policies that hurt the deepening of shared goals between the U.S. and its African partners. Europe American foreign policy has long benefited from cooperation with the countries of Europe, generally, the EU, and any conservative administration should build on this resource. Yet the transatlantic relationship is complex, with security, trade, and political dimensions. First, the Europe, Eurasia and Russia region is made up of relatively wealthy and technologically advanced societies that should be expected to bear a fair share of both security needs and global security architecture, 
the United States cannot be expected to provide a defense umbrella for countries unwilling to contribute appropriately. At stake after 2024 will be examining the status of the Wales Pledge of 2% of gross domestic product toward defense by NATO members. The new administration will also want to encourage nations to exceed that pledge. Second, transatlantic trade is a significant part of the global economy, and it is in the U.S. national interest to amplify it, especially because this means weaning Europe of its dependence on China. However, there are also transatlantic trade tensions that disturb the U.S.-EU relationship and that have been evident across administrations. The U.S. must undertake a comprehensive review of trade arrangements between the EU and the United States to assure that U.S. businesses are treated fairly and to build productive reciprocity. Outside the EU, trade with the post-Brexit UK needs urgent development before London slips back into the orbit of the EU. Third, in the wake of Brexit, EU foreign policy now takes place without UK input, which disadvantages the United States, given that the UK has historically been aligned with many US positions. Therefore, US diplomacy must be more attentive to inner EU developments, while also developing new allies inside the EU especially the Central European countries on the eastern flank of the EU, which are most vulnerable to Russian aggression. South and Central Asia Many key American interests and responsibilities are found in South and Central Asia. Specifically, continuing to advance the bilateral relationship with India to mutual benefit is a crucial objective for U.S. policy. India plays a crucial role in countering the Chinese threat and securing a free and open Indo-Pacific. It is a critical security guarantor for the key routes of air and sea travel linking East and West and an important emerging U.S. economic partner. For instance, the 2019 Department of Defense Indo-Pacific Strategy Report noted that the Indian Ocean area is at the nexus of global trade and commerce, with nearly half of the world's 90,000 commercial vessels and two-thirds of global oil trade traveling through its sea lanes. The region boasts some of the fastest-growing economies on Earth. 14. Meanwhile, the threat of transnational terrorism remains acute. The humiliating withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan after a 20-year military campaign has created new challenges. It has provided an opportunity to reset the deeply troubled U.S.-Pakistan relationship and reassess U.S. counterterrorism strategy in the region. The long-standing India-Pakistan rivalry and tensions regarding the disputed territory of Kashmir continue to pose risks to regional stability, especially because both countries are nuclear powers. The State Department's role in strengthening the regional security and economic framework linking the U.S. and India is crucial. In addition, the department has important functional responsibilities in dealing with a range of threats from nuclear proliferation to transnational proliferation. While American statecraft should also seek to improve bilateral relations throughout the region, U.S. policy must be clear-eyed and realistic about the perfidiousness of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan and the military political rule in Pakistan. There can be no expectation of normal relations with either. The priority for statecraft is advancing the U.S.-Indian role as a cornerstone of the Quad, a cooperative framework including the U.S., India, Japan, and Australia. The Quad is comprised of the key nations in coordinating efforts for a free and open Indo-Pacific. It is an overarching group that nests the key U.S. bilateral and trilateral cooperative efforts that facilitate U.S. collaborative efforts across the Indo-Pacific. The State Department should also encourage the Quad Plus concept that allows other regional powers to participate in Quad coordination on issues of mutual interest. Further, the State Department must support an integrated federal effort to deliver a revamped regional strategy for South Asia, as well as leading the execution of key tasks to implement the strategy. Point 15. The Arctic. Because of Alaska, the U.S. is an Arctic nation. The Arctic is a vast expanse of land and sea rich in resources including fish, minerals, and energy. For example, the region is estimated to contain 90 million barrels of oil and one quarter of the world's undiscovered natural gas reserves. Point 16 The Arctic is lightly populated, only 4 million people in the world live above the Arctic Circle, with more than half of those living in Russia. Only around 68,000 people in Alaska live above the Arctic Circle. Point 17 However, the sheer immensity of the Alaskan Arctic means its population density is less than one person per square mile. Point 18 the United States has several strong interests in the Arctic region. The rate of melting ice during summer months has led to increased interest not only from shipping and tourism sectors, but also from America's global competitors, who are interested in exploiting the region's strategic importance and accessing its bounty of natural resources. In the not-too-distant future, there will be a growing interest in the Arctic from both state and non-state actors alike. China has been open about its interest in the region, primarily as a highway for trade but also for its rich natural resources. While the PRC's increasing intervention in Arctic affairs is a bit strained because it does not have an Arctic coastline, Russia does and Russia has made no secret of its view that the Arctic is vital for economic and military reasons. Russia has invested heavily in new and refurbished Arctic bases and cold weather equipment and capabilities. The North Star of U.S. Arctic policy should remain national sovereignty. Safeguarded through robust capabilities as well as through diplomatic, economic, and legal attentiveness. The next administration should embrace the view that NATO must acknowledge. That it is, in part, an Arctic alliance. 
With the likely accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO, every Arctic nation except for Russia will be a NATO member state. NATO has been slow to appreciate that the Arctic is a theatre that it must defend, especially considering Russia's brazen aggression against Ukraine. NATO must develop and implement an Arctic strategy that recognizes the importance of the region and ensures that Russian use of Arctic waters and resources does not exceed a reasonable footprint. The U.S. should unapologetically pursue American interests in the Arctic by promoting economic freedom in the region. Economic freedom spurs prosperity, innovation, respect for the rule of law, jobs, and sustainability. Most important, economic freedom can help to keep the Arctic stable and secure. The U.S. should work to ensure that shipping lanes in the Arctic remain available to all global commercial traffic and free of onerous fees and burdensome administrative, regulatory, and military requirements. While this should be the next administration's policy with respect to all countries that might seek to block free-flowing commercial traffic, the next administration will clearly have to exert substantial attention toward Russia. Both the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. Navy are vital tools to ensure an unmonopolized Arctic. It is imperative that the Navy and Coast Guard continue to expand their fleets, including planned icebreaker acquisitions, to assure Arctic access for the United States and other friendly actors. The remote and harsh conditions of the Arctic also make unmanned system investment and use particularly appealing for providing additional situational awareness, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. The Coast Guard should also consider upgrading facilities, such as its Barrow Station, to reinforce its Arctic capabilities and demonstrate a greater commitment to the region. The People's Republic of China has declared itself a near-Arctic state, which is an imaginary term non-existent in international discourse. The United States should work with like-minded Arctic nations, including Russia, to raise legitimate concerns about the PRC's so-called Polar Silk Road ambitions. Concerning Greenland, the opening of a U.S. consulate in Nuke is welcome. A formal year-round diplomatic presence is an effective way for the U.S. to better understand local political and economic dynamics. Furthermore, given Greenland's geographic proximity and its rising potential as a commercial and tourist location, the next administration should pursue policies that enhance economic ties between the U.S. and Greenland. International Organizations Defending and protecting the American people and advancing their interests requires the United States to engage in a broad spectrum of bilateral and multilateral relationships, including participating in international organizations. Working with other governments through international organizations like the United Nations, UN, can be tremendously useful but membership in these organizations must always be understood as a means to attain defined goals rather than an end in itself. Engagement with international organizations is one relatively easy way for the U.S. to defend its interests and to seek to address problems in concert with other nations but it is not the only option and American diplomats should be clear-eyed about international organizations' strengths and weaknesses. When such institutions act against U.S. interests, the United States must be prepared to take appropriate steps in response, up to and including withdrawal. The manifest failure and corruption of the World Health Organization, who, during the COVID-19 pandemic is an example of the danger that international organizations pose to U.S. citizens and interests. The next administration must end blind support for international organizations. If an international organization is effective and advances American interests, the United States should support it. If an international organization is ineffective or does not support American interests, the United States should not support it. Those that are effective will still require constant pressure from U.S. officials to ensure that they remain effective. Serious consideration should also be given to withdrawal from organizations that no longer have value, quietly undermine U.S. interests or goals, or disproportionately rely on U.S. financial contributions. To survive the Trump administration's tough love approach to international organizations served American interests. For example, the Trump administration withdrew from, or terminated funding for, the United Nations Human Rights Council, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, and the WHO. The results were redeployment of taxpayer dollars to better uses and other organizations getting the message that the United States will not allow itself and its money to be used to undermine its own interests. The Biden administration reversed many of these decisions. Currently, U.S. funding for international organizations is more than $16 billion in fiscal year 2021 a sharp increase from $10.8 billion in fiscal year 2015.19 and millions of American taxpayer dollars go to support policies and initiatives that hurt the United States and American citizens. The next administration should direct the Secretary of State to initiate a comprehensive cost-benefit analysis of U.S. participation in all international organizations. This review should take into account long-standing provisions in federal law that prohibit the use of taxpayer dollars to promote abortion, population control, and terrorist activities, as well as other applicable restrictions on funding for international organizations and agencies with a view to withholding U.S. funds in cases of abuses. International organizations should not be used to promote radical social policies as if they were human rights priorities. Doing so undermines actual human rights and weakens U.S. credibility abroad. 
the next administration should use its voice, influence, votes, and funding in international organizations to promote authentic human rights and respect for sovereignty based on the binding international obligations contained in treaties that have been constitutionally ratified by the U.S. government. It must promote a strict text-based interpretation of treaty obligations that does not consider human rights treaties as living instruments both within the State Department and within international organizations that receive U.S. funding, including by making respect for sovereignty and authentic human rights a litmus test of personnel decisions and elections processes within international organizations. The U.S. Commission on Unalienable Human Rights focused on the primacy of civil and political rights in its inaugural report, which remains an important guidepost for bilateral and multilateral engagements on human rights. The Commission's report is a roadmap for revamping and re-energizing U.S. human rights policy and should be the basis for both structural and policy changes throughout the State Department. Point 20 All U.S. multilateral engagements must be re-evaluated in light of the work of the Commission, and initiatives that promote controversial policies must be halted and rolled back. It is paramount to create a healthy culture of respect for life, the family, sovereignty, and authentic human rights in international organizations and agencies. To support this goal, the U.S. led an effort during the Trump administration to forge a consensus among like-minded countries in support of human life, women's health, support of the family as the basic unit of human society, and defense of national sovereignty. The result was the Geneva Consensus Declaration on Women's Health and Protection of the Family. Point 21 All U.S. foreign policy engagements that were produced and expanded under the Obama and Biden administrations must be aligned with the Geneva Consensus Declaration and the work of the U.S. Commission on Unalienable Human Rights. The U.S. government should not and cannot promote or fund abortion in international programs or multilateral organizations. Technically, the United States can prevent its international funding from going toward abortions, but the U.S. will have a greater impact by including like-minded nations and building on the coalition. Launched through the Geneva Consensus Declaration, with a view to shaping the work of international agencies by functioning as a united front. The COVID-19 pandemic made it painfully clear that both international organizations and some countries are only too willing to trample human rights in the name of public health. For example, the WHO was, and remains, willing to support the suppression of basic human rights, partially because of its close relationship with human rights abusers like the PRC. The next administration should unequivocally embrace the premise that humanity and the international community can simultaneously tackle pandemics and other emergent health threats without impeding the rights of people. It must also become a vocal surrogate for people in countries where rights are being suppressed in the name of health. This will likely require greater restrictions on the supply of federal dollars to the WHO and other health-focused international organizations pending adjustment of their policies. The United States must return to treating international organizations as vehicles for promoting American interests or take steps to extract itself from those organizations. Shaping the future Development of a grand foreign policy strategy is key to the next administration's success but without addressing structural and related issues of the State Department, this strategy will be at risk. The Hart-Rudman Commission called for a significant restructuring of the State Department specifically and foreign assistance programs generally, stating that funding increases could only be justified if there was greater confidence that institutions would use their funding effectively. Point 22 Sadly, the exact opposite has occurred. The State Department has metastasized in structure and resources, but neither the function of the department nor the use of taxpayer dollars has improved. The next administration can take steps to remedy these deficiencies. The State Department's greatest problem is certainly not an absence of resources. As noted, the department boasts tens of thousands of employees and billions of dollars of funding including significant amounts of discretionary funding. It also exists among a broader array of federal agencies that are duplicative, particularly when it comes to the provision of direct and indirect foreign assistance. Realistically, meaningful reform of the State Department will require significant streamlining. Below are some key structural and operational recommendations that will be essential for the next administration's success, and which will lay crucial foundations for other necessary reforms. L. Develop a reorganization strategy. Despite periodic attempts by previous administrations, including the Trump administration, to make more than cosmetic changes to the State Department, its structure has remained largely unchanged since the 20th century. Point 23 The State Department will better serve future administrations, regardless of party, if it were to be meaningfully streamlined. The next administration should develop a complete hypothetical reorganization of the department one which would tighten accountability to political leadership, reduce overhead, eliminate redundancy, waste fewer taxpayer resources, and recommend additional personnel-related changes for improvement of function. Such reorganization could be creative, but also carefully review specific structure-related problems that have been documented over the years. This reorganization effort would necessarily assess what office closures can be carried out with and without congressional approval. Timelines for action on these fronts should be developed accordingly, but speed should be a priority. L. Consolidate foreign assistance authorities. Foreign assistance is a critical foreign policy tool that is too often disconnected from the federal government's practice of foreign policy. 
bureaucrats spend significant energy resisting the use of non-emergency foreign assistance to leverage positive results for the United States, even though it is a perfectly reasonable proposition. The coordination of foreign assistance dollars is also difficult because the foreign assistance budget and foreign loan issuance authorities are divided across numerous cabinet departments, smaller agencies, and other offices. The next administration should take steps to ensure that future foreign assistance clearly and unambiguously supports the president's foreign policy agenda. For example, the next administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, which is technically subordinate to the State Department, should be authorized to take on the additional role of Director of Foreign Assistance with the rank of Deputy Secretary and oversee all foreign assistance. This role which existed briefly during the George W. Bush administration before it was eliminated by the Obama administration would empower the dual-hatted official to better align and coordinate with the manifold foreign assistance programs across the federal government. The next administration should also evaluate whether these multiple sources of foreign assistance are in the national interest and, if not, develop a plan to consolidate foreign assistance authorities. L. Make public diplomacy and international broadcasting serve American interests. A key part of U.S. foreign policy is the ability to communicate with not only governments but with the peoples of the world. Indeed, in some ways, communicating directly with the public is more important than communicating with governments, particularly in times of governmental conflict or disagreement. Public diplomacy has historically been, and remains, vital to American foreign policy success. Unfortunately, U.S. public diplomacy, which largely relies on taxpayer-funded international broadcasting outlets, has been deeply ineffective in recent years. The U.S. government's first foray into international broadcasting started with the Voice of America radio broadcast in 1942 which was intended as a tool to communicate directly with the people of Europe during World War II. During the next half-century, America's international broadcasting efforts both expanded and increased in sophistication as the United States shifted out of its hot war in Europe and into the Cold War with the Soviet Union. U.S. international broadcasting prowess, and the confident willingness to communicate the correctness of American ideals in the face of global resistance, arguably hit its peak near the conclusion of the Cold War in the late 1980s. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the subsequent collapse of Soviet and Eastern Bloc communism, factors including the false appeal of a so-called peace dividend triggered a slide in the U.S. ability to communicate a pro-freedom message to the rest of the world and in its commitment to do so. Ironically, this slide accompanied the rise of the Internet and mobile phone technologies, which arguably facilitated the most significant revolution in human communication since the invention of the printing press. The United States must reassert its public diplomacy obligations by restoring its international broadcasting infrastructure as part of the broader U.S. foreign policy framework, consolidating broadcasting resources and recommitting to people-focused and pro-freedom messaging and content. L. Engage in cyber diplomacy. Cyberspace has become an arena for competition between the U.S. and nations that seek and export digital authoritarianism. Cyberspace protection is critical to national security and deserving of commensurate diplomatic resources. Defined as the use of diplomatic tools to address issues arising in and through cyberspace, cyber diplomacy is a key part of the U.S. government's toolkit for preventing and addressing cyber threats. Point 24. The model for cyberspace that the U.S. espouses is based on democracy and freedom of information. It is an open, interoperable, secure, reliable, market drive, domain that reflects democratic values and protects privacy. 25. Russia and China, meanwhile, are authoritarian regimes that use the Internet to limit public opposition and control information. They have created technological tools to enforce dominance over their peoples, and at the UN and international organizations dealing with cyberspace, they strive to push standards that assist their totalitarian efforts and undermine Western nations. Simultaneously, Russia, China, and lesser adversaries exploit the more open networks of countries like the US to undermine democracy through disinformation and propaganda. They have attempted to influence US elections, enabled or encouraged actors to exploit cyber vulnerabilities to commit theft of real or intellectual property and have challenged U.S. governmental, military, and critical infrastructure networks with targeted malware. In short, the cyberspace era has gradually evolved from one of exploration, innovation, and cooperation to one that retains these features but is also marked by aggressive competition and persistent threats. To meet this reality, the State Department must move beyond its traditional model of attempting to establish non-binding, informal world standards of acceptable cyberspace behavior. The State Department should work with allies to establish a clear framework of enforceable norms for actions in cyberspace moving beyond the voluntary norms of the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts. Point 26. The State Department should also assist the Department of Defense to go on offense against adversaries. Deterrence as a strategic approach has not stemmed the onslaught of cyber aggression below the level of armed conflict. 27. The traditional U.S. defensive approach based on deterrence followed by reaction to crossed red lines is no longer effective. Adversaries can evade this strategy through multiple tactical lines of action below the level of armed conflict, and such actions have a cumulative strategic effect. The State Department's role should be to work with allies and engage with adversaries when necessary to draw clear lines of unacceptable conduct.
Global financial infrastructure, nuclear controls, and public health are particularly important areas in which consensus may even be found across ideological lines. These mission essential institutional initiatives should be joined with others to establish a presidentially directed and durable U.S. foreign policy. Conclusion The next conservative president has the opportunity and the duty to restructure the creation and execution of U.S. foreign policy so that it is focused on his or her vision for the nation's role in the world. The Policy Ideas and Reform Recommendations Outlined in this chapter provide guidance about how the State Department can contribute to this objective. In the main, this chapter refocuses attention away from the special interests and social experiments that are used in some quarters to capture U.S. foreign policy. The ideas and recommendations herein are premised on the belief that a rigorous adherence to the national interest is the most enduring foundation for U.S. grand strategy in the 21st century. Authors note, thanks to the entire State Department chapter team, the leaders and staff of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project, and my colleagues at the Heritage Foundation's Davis Center. In particular, I would like to acknowledge the following colleagues, Russell Berman, Sarah Calvies, James Carafano, Spencer Cratian, Wesley Coopersmith, Paul Dans, Stephen Groves, Simon Hankinson, Joseph Humeyer, Michael Pillsbury, Max Primorak, Reed Rubenstein, Brett Schaefer, Jeff Smith, Hilary Tanoff, Aaron Walsh, and John Zadrosny. End Notes 1 U.S. Department of State, about the U.S. Department of State, our history https slash slash www.state.gov slash about slash accessed march 9 2023 to the balance of employment is 2149 eligible family members and 50223 locally employed staff u.s department of state gtm fact sheet facts about our most valuable asset our people global talent management december 31 2022 https slash slash www.state.gov slash wp content slash upload slash 2023 slash 01 slash gtm underscore fact sheet 1222.pdf accessed march 9 2023 3 u.s commission on national security roadmap for national security imperative for change phase 3 report february 15 2001 px http colon slash slash govinfo.library.unt.edu slash nssg slash phase 2 ifr.pdf accessed march 9 2023 4c brett d schaefer how to make the state department more effective at implementing u.s foreign policy heritage foundation backgrounder number 3115 april 20 2016 https slash slash www.heritage.org slash political process slash report slash how make the state department more effective implementing us foreign 5. Historically, roughly one-third of ambassadorial appointments have been political appointments, although Republican administrations have generally had a higher ratio of political appointments than Democratic administrations. 6. U.S. Constitution, Art. 2. Sector 2, CL2. 7. News Release, Secretary Blinken launches the Office of China Coordination, U.S. Department of State, December 16, 2022. HTTPS slash slash www.state.gov slash Secretary Blinken launches the Office of China Coordination slash, accessed March 9, 2023. 8 Immigration and Nationality Act, 8 U.S. Code 1101 ETSEQ, 1253. 9 C. Michael Pillsbury, The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace the United States as a Global Superpower, New York, St. Martin's Griffin, 2016. 10 for additional context regarding how countering China fits in a more robust U.S. strategy, see James J. Carafano ETAL, Foreign Policy, Strategy for a Post-Bidden Era, Heritage Foundation Backgrounder No. 3715, July 21, 2022, https www.heritage.org slash defense slash report slash foreign policy strategy post-bidden era. 11 The Article X for China would follow George Kennan's Article X for U.S.-Soviet competition. See George F. Kennan. The Sources of Soviet Conduct, Foreign Affairs, July 1947, https slash slash article slash Russian Federation slash 1947-07-01 slash Sources Soviet Conduct, accessed March 22, 2023. 12. Dean Cheng ETAL, Assessing Beijing's Power, A Blueprint for the U.S. Response to China Over the Next Decades, Heritage Foundation Special Report No. 221, February 20, 2010. HTTPS slash slash www.heritage.org slash Asia slash report slash assessing Beijing's power blueprint the US response China over the next decades. 13. Eric W. Orts, The Rule of Law in China, Vanderbilt Journal of Transnational Law, Volume 34, Number 1, January 2001, HTTPS slash slash scholarship.law.vanderbilt.edu slash CGI slash view content.cgi, article equals 1686 and context equals VJTL, accessed March 9, 2023. 14 U.S. Department of Defense, 
Indo-Pacific Strategy Report, Preparedness, Partnerships and Promoting a Networked Region, June 1, 2019 https slash slash media dot defense dot gov slash twenty nineteen slash jewel slash zero one slash two zero zero two one five two three one one slash one slash one slash one slash department of defense indo pacific strategy report twenty nineteen dot pdf accessed july twenty eighth twenty twenty two fifteen c jeff smith south asia a new strategy heritage foundation backgrounder number three thousand seven hundred and twenty one august twenty ninth twenty twenty two https slash slash www.heritage.org slash asia slash report slash south asia new strategy 16 emma bryce why is there so much oil in the arctic life science august 3rd 2019 https slash slash www.lifescience.com slash 66008 why oil in arctic html accessed february 9th 2023 17 changes in the arctic background and issues for congress congressional research service report for congress Updated January 26, 2021, P6, https slash slash chrisreports.congress.gov slash product slash pdf slash r slash r41153 slash 177, accessed March 9, 2023. 18 U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology, Snapshot, Overcoming the Tyranny of Distance in the Arctic, April 20, 2020. HTTPS slash slash www.dhs.gov slash science and technology slash news slash 2020 slash 04 slash 20 slash snapshot overcoming tyranny distance Arctic, accessed February 9, 2023. 19 U.S. Department of State, U.S. Contributions to International Organizations, 2021, September 20, 2022. HTTPS slash slash www.state.gov slash U.S. Contributions to International Organizations 2021 slash Accessed March 9, 2023, and U.S. Department of State, U.S. Contributions to International Organizations, 2015, November 1, 2016, HTTPS slash slash www.state.gov slash U.S. Contributions to International Organizations 2015 slash, accessed March 9, 2023. 20 U.S. Department of State, Report on the Commission of Inalienable Rights, https slash slash www.state.gov slash wp content slash upload slash 2020 slash 07 slash draft report of the commission on unalienable rights pdf accessed march 9 2023 21 geneva consensus declaration on promoting women's health and strengthening the family october 22 2021 https slash slash www.thewhite.org slash wp content slash upload slash 2022 slash 02 slash gcd declaration 2021 2.pdf accessed march 13 2023 22 u.s commission on national security roadmap for national security 23 u.s department of state organization chart november 2004 https slash slash 2009-2017.state.gov slash s slash d slash rm slash rls slash perfurb slash 2004 slash html slash 39764 htm accessed march 9, 2023 u.s department of state organization chart november 2016 https slash slash 2009-2017.state.gov slash documents slash organization slash 263637.pdf accessed march 9, 2023 U.S. Department of State, Organization Chart, February 2020, HTTPS slash slash 2017-2021.state.gov slash WP content slash upload slash 2021 slash 01 slash department org chart Feb 2020-508.pdf, accessed March 9, 2023, U.S. Department of State, DOS org chart August 2021, August 2021. HTTPS slash slash www.state.gov slash Department of State Organization Chart slash DOS org chart August 2021 slash, accessed March 9, 2023, and U.S. Department of State, Organization Chart, May 2022, HTTPS slash slash www.state.gov slash WP content slash upload slash 2022 slash 05 slash DOS org chart 5052022 non accessible .pdf, accessed March 9, 2023. 24 Emily O. Goldman, Cyber Diplomacy for Strategic Competition, Fresh Thinking and New Approaches are Needed on Diplomacy's Newest Frontier, Foreign Service Journal, June 2021, http colon slash slash afsa.org slash cyber hyphen diplomacy hyphen strategic hyphen competition, accessed March 9, 2023. 25 Emily Goldman, From Reaction to Action, Adopting a Competitive Posture in Cyber Diplomacy, Texas National Security Review, Volume 3, Number 4, Fall 2020, 
https slash slash tnsr.org slash wp content slash upload slash 2020 slash 09 slash tnsr vol 3 iss 4 goldman dot pdf accessed march 9th 2023 26 united nations general assembly group of government experts on advancing responsible state behavior in cyberspace in the context of international security a slash 76 slash 135 july 14th 2021 https slash slash front dot unarm dot org slash wp content slash upload slash 2021 slash 08 slash a underscore 76 underscore 135 dash 2104030 e1 dot pdf accessed march 10th 2023 27 goldman cyber diplomacy warning empty page 7 intelligence community dustin j carmack mission statement to arm a future incoming conservative president with the knowledge and tools necessary to fortify the United States intelligence community, to defend against all foreign enemies and ensure the security and prosperity of our sovereign nation, devoid of all political motivations, and to maintain constitutional civil liberties. Overview The United States intelligence community, IC, is a vast, intricate bureaucracy spread throughout 18 independent and cabinet subagencies. Point 1 According to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI, the IC's mission is to collect, analyze, and deliver foreign intelligence and counterintelligence information to America's leaders so they can make sound decisions to protect our country. 2. An incoming conservative president needs to use these intelligence authorities aggressively to anticipate and thwart our adversaries, including Russia, Iran, North Korea, and especially China, while maintaining counterterrorism tools that have demonstrated their effectiveness. This means empowering the right personnel to manage, build, and effectively execute actions dispersed throughout the IC to deliver intelligence in an ever challenging world. It also means removing redundancies. Mission creep, and I see infighting that could prevent these collection tools from providing objective, apolitical, and empirically backed intelligence to the IC's premier customer, the President of the United States. Today, as Abraham Lincoln famously said, the occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. We must think anew, and act anew. 3. The intelligence community maintains an incredible capacity to achieve its mission, but both the IC and the somewhat antiquated infrastructure that supports it often plays too high a priority on yesterday's threats and methodologies instead of trying to identify possible future threats or the methodologies that might be needed to combat them. The IC also often spends too much time overcorrecting. For past mistakes. The unintended consequences include hesitancy, groupthink, and an overly cautious approach that allows personal incentives to drive preset courses. The IC must be perceived as a depoliticized protector of America's civil rights and security. The American people are understandably frustrated by the fact that those who abuse power are rarely held to account for their actions. This must change, beginning with leadership that is both committed to ensuring that these agencies faithfully execute the laws of the land under the Constitution and resolve to punish and remove any officials who have abused the public trust. The IC must also start to look forward, not backward. A concerted, disciplined, leadership-led initiative must be undertaken to refocus and shift IC prioritization, funding, and authorities to new and emerging threats, technologies, and methodologies. If the United States is to prevail against its global adversaries. Point four, unfortunately, America's major strategic threat is a nation state peer and possibly ahead of the U.S. in strategic areas. An incoming president must understand that today's intelligence competition could well require analyzing technologies the U.S. does not have or compartmentalizing certain information as was done during the Cold War because of intelligence penetration. A future president's ability to drive the resources needed to defeat another nation state giant should therefore be the focus of near term IC reforms. Office of the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI. The ODNI was established in the aftermath of the attacks on September 11 and intelligence. Failures leading up to the 2003 U.S. war in Iraq. The office and its functions stem from authorities established under executive orders promulgated by President George W. Bush in 2004, followed by statutory authorizations in the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004, IRPA, point five. Proponents of an ODNI hope to establish reforms similar to the Goldwater Nichols Department of Defense, DOD, reforms of the 1980s, which identified recurring problems within DOD's command and control architecture and led to unified combatant commands with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as the senior ranking member of the armed forces and principal military advisor to the president. The ODNI was envisioned as a small but powerful IC coordinating agency led by a director of national intelligence, DNI. As the president's principal intelligence advisor, the DNI would lead and provide oversight of the president's intelligence authorities while wielding a cudgel budget and appointment. Authorities to break institutional silos that had caused past intelligence integration. Failures. Originally envisioned by the 9-11th Commission as a strengthened, authoritative position, the final congressionally negotiated product signed by President Bush has led to ambiguous and vague authorities that are dependent on who is selected as DNI and Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, 
Director and their level of support from the White House and National Security Council, NSC. 9-11's Commission Executive Director Philip Zalikow warned in a 2004 hearing that creating a new agency lacking any existing institutional base, would require authorities at least as strong as those we have proposed or else it would create a bureaucratic fifth wheel that would make the present situation even worse. 6. The ODNI has become that bureaucratic fifth wheel about which Zalikow warned. For example, under the Bush administration's initial legislative proposal, the CIA director would have been under the authority, direction, and control of the DNI and no longer the head of an autonomous agency. Additional mechanisms envision full-budget authority for the DNI, including within DOD's intelligence components, as opposed to coordinating authority. Through arduous sausage. Making and relatively quick negotiations, lawmakers produced statutorily vague authorities that traded away the DNI's ability to direct budgetary authority across the entire IC, including DOD, and left the CIA a subordinate but independent agency with duties to report to the DNI without explicit directing authority. These statutory developments were what led President Bush's first choice to serve as DNI, Robert Gates, to turn down the position. In discussions with the White House over the post, Gates noted that the legislation weakened the leadership of the community and that instead of a stronger person, you ended up with a weaker person because the DNI had no troops and no additional powers really on the budget, hiring, and firing. Seven Gates noted that success would require the president to make explicit publicly that the DNI is head of the intelligence community, not some budgeter or coordinator, and that t he positions only prayer of success is for the president to say plainly, how he sees the job. Without his explicit mandate, the endeavor is doomed to fail. 8. One of the two DNIs confirmed by the Senate during the Trump administration. John Ratcliffe, acknowledged that Gates's theoretical concerns became the practical reality that he inherited. Prior DNIs were the head of the IC only on paper and were routinely accustomed to yielding IC actions and decisions to the preferences of the CIA and other agencies. My ability to begin reversing that capitulation was accomplished solely because President Trump made it repeatedly clear to the entire national security apparatus that he expected all intelligence matters to go through the DNI.9. To help further the legislative intent behind IRPA, DNI Ratcliffe advised during the transition of incoming bidden DNI Avril Haines that the DNI should be the only cabinet-level intelligence official.10 while his recommendation was adopted and has corrected the previously allowed imbalance by making the DNI the only cabinet official and head of the IC at the table, the ODNI's effectiveness and direction leave much to be desired. A conservative president must decide how to empower an individual to oversee and manage the intelligence community effectively. To be successful, the DNI and ODNI must be able to lead the IC and implement the president's intelligence priorities. This includes being able to exercise both budget and personnel authority and being able to rely on timely, useful feedback from subordinate components of the IC, many of which are located within other cabinet agencies. The ODNI needs to direct, not replicate in-house, the other IC agencies' analytic, operational, and management functions. Considerations like mismanagement of human resources, joint duty assignments, and accelerated growth in senior personnel can cause a president to dictate to his incoming DNI a desire to slash redundant positions and expenditures while simultaneously giving the DNI the authority to drive necessary changes throughout the IC to deal with the nation's most compelling threats, including those emanating from China. As John Radcliffe has noted, these are essential to the DNI having the abilities and authorities to effectively direct, coordinate, and tackle the immense national security challenges ahead for the intelligence community as intended under IRPA 11. Otherwise, other cabinet and subordinate IC agencies will continue to regard the ODNI as an annoyance and not as a positive contributor to the national intelligence program, NIP, budget. They will continue to work around or circumvent ODNI leadership decisions with appropriators and the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, or seek to wait out an administration or DNI to prevent a policy or intelligence priority from reaching fruition. Intelligence and interagency coordination has improved significantly since 9 11 Nevertheless, Interagency rivalries and festering issues continue to cause duplication of effort on intelligence analysis and technology purchases as well as overclassification and ever-increasing compartmentalization. Additional issues include the abuse of mandated onboarding approval and reciprocity timelines by some agencies, recruitment and retention failures, and a lack of will to remove underperforming or timely adjudicate the misconduct of senior managers and other employees. Finally, future IC leadership must address the widely promoted woke culture. That has spread throughout the federal government with identity politics and social justice advocacy replacing such traditional American values as patriotism, colorblindness, and even workplace competence. Executive Order 12333 IRPA was passed in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks against the homeland. It was intended to improve the sharing of information among the elements of the IC, recognizing that the nature of the threats we now face blurs the lines between foreign and domestic intelligence in detecting and countering national security threats against the homeland. An equally important objective in passing the most significant intelligence reform since the National Security Act of 194,712 was creation of the position of DNI, charged with assuming two of the three principal roles that formerly belonged to the Director of Central Intelligence, 
DCI serving as principal intelligence advisor to the president and leading the IC as an enterprise. Nearly two decades later, the DNI's record of effectiveness in improving the sharing of information and operating the IC as an enterprise is mixed. Implementation of the DNI's roles as leader of the IC and principal intelligence advisor to the president has been challenging. However, despite flaws in the legislation and intelligence agencies' bureaucratic jockeying that undermine the DNI, it is impossible to know what would emerge if Congress were to revisit the act. Seeking a legislative solution therefore might carry with it more risks than benefits. Instead, an incoming conservative president's immediate focus should be on modifying Executive Order 12,333, the president's direction for implementing IRPA.13. Executive Order 12,333 was last amended on July 30, 2008, by President George W. Bush.14 The revisions were aligned with IRPA with significant emphasis on having the IC address the threats to the homeland from international terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. There is scant mention of cyber threats and the evolving national security challenges posed by China, Russia, and other U.S. adversaries. By extension, the revised order fell short of stipulating how the DNI would execute his authority to organize the IC in a manner that improves the delivery of timely intelligence to a wide array of customers. Executive Order 12333 should be amended to take account of the changing landscape of threats and improve the functional aspects of America's intelligence enterprise. To that end, a revised order should L. Address the threats to the United States and its allies in cyberspace. These threats range from cyber warfare to information operations. The amended order should clearly delineate the roles and responsibilities of the various U.S. government cyber missions, including the recently created National Cyber Director's Office and Power Centers at the NSC, while protecting the privacy and civil liberties of U.S. citizens. Under the DNI's direction, the cyber mission should explicitly identify how information in the cyber domain will be shared promptly with the warfighters, from law enforcement agencies to the broader IC and state local, and tribal elements. The order should consider stipulating what to do with Dodd cyber agencies, most notably the NSA, in terms of strategic, for example, the President and the DNI, versus tactical support, for example, support for the warfighter, in conjunction with ongoing congressionally mandated reviews of the future dual-hatted relationship. L. Enhance the DNI's role in overseeing execution of the National Intelligence Program budget under the President's authority. This should be done in a manner that is consistent with Congress's intent as embodied in IRPA. Under the executive order as written today, the DNI shall oversee and direct the implementation of the National Intelligence Program. In practice, the DNI's authority to oversee execution of the IC's budget remains constrained by an inability to address changing intelligence priorities and mandate the implementation of appropriated NIP funding to higher intelligence priorities. The DNI should have the President's direction to address emerging but catastrophic threats such as those posed by bioweapons. Clarifying how much budget authority the DNI has in conjunction, within the limits of congressional appropriations, with OMB and IC member cabinet officials to move around money and personnel is crucial, but positions will not always be fungible. It will probably be necessary to hold IC leadership accountable at intransigent agencies and to restructure areas through executive orders in close conjunction with OMB, as needed. L. Clarify the DNI's role as leader of the IC as an enterprise in building the IC's capabilities around its open source collection and analytic missions. The exponential growth in open source information, often called OSINT, is not disputed. In the IC, the use of publicly available information, notwithstanding the authorities within IRPA for the DNI to manage OSINT, remains disaggregated. The explosion of private sector intelligence products and expertise should signal to IC leadership that duplicative efforts are unnecessary and that limited resources should be focused on problematic collection tasks. The IC should avoid duplication of what is already being done well in the private sector and focus instead on complex questions that cannot be answered by conventional and frequently increasing numbers of commercial tools and capabilities. If necessary, for lack of results from the National Open Source Committee, the DNI should appoint the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, PNI, as Chairman to prioritize and promote accountability for the IC's 18 agencies toward this effort. L. Prioritize Security Clearance Reform Security clearance reform has made significant progress under Trusted Workforce 2.0, a government-wide background investigation reform that was implemented beginning in 2018 with the goal of creating one system with reciprocity across organizations. This included allowing movement from periodic reinvestigations toward a continuous vetting, CV, program with automated records checks, adjudication of flags, the mitigate ion of personnel security situations before they become a larger problem, or the suspension or revocation of clearances. Point 15 However, human resources onboarding operations in major agencies such as the CIA, FBI, and NSA remain to be resolved. As executive agent for security clearances, the DNI must require results from agencies that resist implementation, enforce the 48 hour reciprocity guidance and target human resources operations that fail to attract and expediently onboard qualified personnel. Additional carrots and sticks from executive order reform language, 
including moving the Security Services Directorate from NCSC to ODNI with elevated status, may be necessary. It is unacceptable for agencies to hinder opportunities for cross-agency assignments, use public-private partnerships inefficiently because of constraints on the transferability of security clearances, and lose future talent because of extraordinary delays in back-end operations. Proper vetting to speed the onboarding of personnel with much-needed expertise is vital to the IC's future. L. Ensure the DNI's authority. The DNI's authority should be similar to an orchestra conductor's. An incoming conservative president will appoint whomever he chooses as DNI, but there should be agreement between the incoming DNI and president with advice and counsel from the Presidential Personnel Office on selecting positions overseen by the DNI throughout subordinate agencies, as well as concurrence by relevant cabinet officials in the CIA. This exists by executive order, but many presidents, PPOs, and cabinet agency heads do not follow executive order guidance and necessary norms. The importance of trust, character, and the ability to work together to achieve a joint set of intelligence goals established by the president cannot be overstated, it is a mission that can be accomplished only with the conductor and his orchestra playing in sync. L. Provide additional support for such economic and supply chain-focused agencies as the Department of Commerce. Information sharing and feedback can help subagencies like the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security to improve their understanding of the threat from China and thereby counter it more effectively. They can also aid the development of export control mechanisms and potential outbound investment screening where necessary. Brief, specific governance language should be considered that would apply counter-terrorist authority models to the broader functions of the U.S. government insofar as they are needed to counter 21st century nation-state threats. The success of any DNI rests with support from the President. Any revised Executive Order 12333 must serve to express unequivocal support for the DNI in executing the mandates that an amended order would provide. Central Intelligence Agency, CIA the CIA is a foreign intelligence collection service tasked with collecting human intelligence, HUMINT, providing all source intelligence analysis and reporting, and conducting covered action when required to do so by the President. The CIA has its roots in the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, which the United States established during World War II as a paramilitary and intelligence collection organization. After World War II, President Harry Truman disbanded the OSS, and the CIA was established in law by the National Security Act of 1947. As with every agency in government, the president's election sets a new agenda for the country. Public servants must be mindful that they are required to help the president implement that agenda while remaining apolitical, upholding the constitution and laws of the United States, and earning the public trust. The president requires a CIA that provides unbiased and apolitical foreign intelligence information and, when necessary, can act capably and effectively on any covered action findings. Executing the Mission the CIA's success depends on firm direction from the President and solid internal CIA director-appointed leadership. Decisive senior leaders must commit to carrying out the President's agenda and be willing to take calculated risks. Therefore, L. The next President-elect and incoming Presidential Personnel Office should identify a director nominee who can foster a mission-driven culture by making necessary personnel and structural changes. L. The President-elect should choose a Deputy Director who, without needing Senate confirmation, can immediately begin to implement the President's agenda. This includes halting all current hiring to prevent the burrowing in of outgoing political personnel. Additional appointees should be placed within the agency as needed to assist the director in supervising its functioning. L. The director and deputy director should request briefings on all CIA activities and presence overseas, as well as any CIA-controlled access programs and existing covered action findings, without exception. L. The director and deputy director should meet with all directorates and mission centers, prioritizing those that are aligned most closely with the President's priorities and calibrating collection and operations based on the President's intelligence requirements. This includes any areas where the CIA might be conducting its own diplomacy parallel to official State Department policy. It must be clear that the CIA's liaison relationships overseas must follow and not contradict those set at the policy level by the President through the State Department. The other principal offices responsible for executing the CIA's mission include the Directorate of Operations, Directorate of Analysis, Directorate of Science and Technology, Directorate of Support, and Directorate of Digital Innovation. If senior leadership finds any program or operation to be inconsistent with the President's agenda, the Director should immediately halt that program or operation. Reigning in Bureaucracy The CIA's bureaucracy continues to grow. Because mid-level managers lack accountability, there are areas in which personnel are not responsive to any authority, including the President. The President should instruct the Director to hire or promote new individuals to lead the various directorates and mission centers. This new crop of mid-level leaders should carry out clear directives from senior CIA leadership, which means more accountability and new ways of thinking to benefit the mission. In addition, the President should task the Director with significantly broadening recruitment, expediting onboarding practices, and shifting resources away from headquarters, including Terminal Generalist GS-15S when OPM buyouts, forced rotations, or up-and-out personnel policies are set for particular positions. 
the CIA must find creative ways to align mission requirements with hiring needs, recruit diverse sets of individuals with unique backgrounds, and become more open to hiring private sector experts directly into senior positions. In addition, the director should break the cabal of bureaucrats in D.C. by permanently moving various directorates, such as support and science and technology, out of Virginia and possibly open campuses outside of D.C. where analysts and other experts could contribute virtually. Redirecting Resources Certain CIA employees and offices have focused on promoting divisive ideological or cultural agendas and fostering a damaging culture of risk aversion and complacency. As soon as possible, the director should divert resources from any activities that promote unnecessary and distracting social engineering. The director should implement changes in promotion criteria that reward individuals for creative thinking and quality of recruitments and products, rather than numeric metrics or the achievement of benchmarks that are not essential to the mission. Not all careers in espionage are created equal, and the director should incentivize and reward applicants who are willing to accept high risks over those who are climbing the ranks simply by doing business as usual. The director should refocus the CIA to an OSS-like culture and mandate that all CIA employees acquire, as a condition of securing senior, GS-14+, plus, rank, additional or enhanced language skills, technical or cyber expertise, or field training or serve in overseas assignments. Covered Action Covered action can be a valuable tool in helping further the president's foreign policy agenda if implemented in concert with other forms of government power. As codified in the U.S. Code, the term covered action means an activity or activities of the United States government to influence political, economic, or military conditions. Abroad, where it is intended that the role of the United States government will not be apparent or acknowledged publicly, 16. The president initiates a covered action with a written finding that explains why such an action is necessary to support identifiable foreign policy objectives of the United States and is important to the national security of the United States. 17 The statute assumes the president will use the CIA as the principal action element to achieve the objectives of covered action findings, however, the president need not feel constrained to utilize only the CIA, EACH finding shall specify each department, agency, or entity of the United States government authorized to fund or otherwise participate in any significant way in such action. 18. For example, the Department of Defense maintains certain clandestine capabilities. Under Title 10 authorities that may resemble but far exceed in scale similar capabilities outside of DOD. Generally, such DOD capabilities can be employed outside a combat theater only if they are determined to be traditional military activities. In practical terms, this means that many DOD capabilities, including those in the space and cyber domains, can be employed only after the initiation of armed conflict. 19. Given the range of global threats the United States faces today, the President should consider whether DOD's complete set of capabilities should be used to support potential covered actions. The problem, unfortunately, is that certain elements in the State Department, IC, and DOD trade on risk aversion or political bureaucracy to delay execution of the President's foreign policy goals. A future conservative President should therefore identify individuals on the transition team who are familiar with the implementation of covered action with a view to placing them in key NSC, CIA, ODNI, and DOD positions. These knowledgeable teams can assist in any review of current covered actions and, potentially, planning for new actions. Immediately after the inauguration, the President should task the NSC Senior Director for Intelligence Programs with conducting a 60-day review of any current covered action findings, including their effectiveness, evaluating new covered actions that might be needed to implement the President's foreign policy goals, and reporting back to the President. Such an assessment should be conducted independently of the agencies responsible for the actions under review. As part of the review, the Senior Director for Intelligence Programs should identify which departments or agencies, such as the CIA or DOD, are best equipped to achieve the objectives set out in new and existing findings. After the 60-day review, the President should demand creative thinking and a clear strategy as to how covered action fits within the President's broader foreign policy strategy, to include possibly modifying or rescinding any current findings, drafting new findings, and streamlining or eliminating needless bureaucracy, particularly at state, to facilitate more expeditious decisions on tactical covered action. Careful thought should be given to the metrics by which the effectiveness of covered action programs will be measured to ensure the appropriate use of government resources and to guard against the possibility of covered actions being used with little scrutiny in ways that are inconsistent with overt foreign policy goals. ODNI and CIA Organizational Recommendations The ODNI and CIA operate under authority provided by the Central Intelligence Agency Act of 1949,20 which means they have greater latitude than the rest of the federal government with respect to the hiring and firing of personnel. Both organizations and other areas of the IC have struggled from a human resources and talent management standpoint to recruit, onboard, and maintain personnel in a timely fashion to fill the IC's ever-changing needs. At a time when the intelligence community needs significantly more personnel with the proper technical, language-capable, and diverse backgrounds, including applicants from elements of the business community, the incoming directors of both agencies need to make this effort a top priority. 
Past DNI's chiefs of staff and additional front office staff historically have come from outside the IC, commonly under a misconstrued staff reserve structure that is intended to avoid a Schedule C designation within the IC. The director should handpick qualified, properly cleared personnel for front office and managerial leadership positions, such as the DNI's chief of staff and heads of legislative affairs and strategic communications, to oversee those divisions with career IC staff reporting to them. The incoming DNI and CIA director should also consider changes in the Senior National Intelligence Service. SNIS, slash Senior Intelligence Services, SIS. Senior officers should be required to sign mobility agreements that allow ODNI and CIA leadership to move them within the IC every two years if necessary. Many qualified and distinguished senior officers serve throughout the IC, but some long-serving generalist officers no longer perform at a high capacity, are management-driven, do not serve the IC's changing needs, and limit junior officers' prospects for growth and advancement. An incoming administration should consider studying and implementing additional requirements as a condition for promotion to GS 15 slash SNIS slash SIS and explore concepts such as up and out beginning at the GS 14 slash 15 levels and above for some fields. The IC should evaluate areas of bloat and underperforming cotter and work with OPM on authority for voluntary separation buyouts. Allowing ODNI and CIA leadership to shrink size and reduce duplication of effort while promoting healthy turnover within their senior ranks would encourage new ideas and perspectives from mid-career officers and, potentially, from employees hired from outside their agencies. The ODNI and CIA should maximize their direct hire and incentive. Building authorities to bring in talented and properly cleared individuals to serve in positions requiring technical, language, and cyber expertise. Finally, the human resources and talent management systems for onboarding purposes at the ODNI, CIA and some other elements of the IC are fundamentally broken. For example, according to current CIA Director William Burns, it recently took more than 600 days, on average for a CIA applicant to receive his or her necessary security clearance. Point 21 Although security clearance procedures have been somewhat improved in recent years and Burns has committed CIA to reducing that to no more than 180 days, degradation in other areas of the process has limited the IC's capacity to attract qualified and needed expertise. Preventing the abuse of intelligence for partisan purposes. The intelligence function must be protected from bottom-up and top-down politicization if it is to play its proper role in our national security decision-making process. Unfortunately, both types of politicization have occurred recently to the detriment of the intelligence community's reputation and credibility. More important, the politicization of intelligence risks contributing to policy failures. As we saw with the Iraq War, or even undermining our democratic system here at home. In particular, the IC must restore confidence in its political neutrality to rectify the damage done by the actions of former IC leaders and personnel regarding the claims of Trump-Russia collusion following the 2016 election and the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop investigation and media revelations of its existence during the 2020 election. But the problem is not confined to the executive branch struggle between the IC and policymakers, it also relates to the IC's relationship with Congress as evinced by DNI James Clapper's failure to answer honestly in response to congressional questions about government surveillance programs. The ODNI and CIA are undergoing a crisis of confidence based on several factors. First, President Barack Obama's CIA director, John Brennan, gravely damaged the CIA by minimizing the Directorate of Operations and exploiting intelligence analysis as a political weapon after he left office. Brennan's role in the letter signed by 51 former intelligence officials before the 2020 election is unclear, but in dismissing the Hunter Biden laptop as Russian disinformation, the CIA was discredited, and the shocking extent of politicization among some former IC officials was revealed. Restoring respect for the IC as an independent provider of information and analysis while also ensuring that it is responsive to the legitimate needs of policymakers will require reinforcing essential norms and institutions. However, we should also recognize that achieving the perfect balance that avoids the pathologies of too much distance or too much closeness and responsiveness to policymakers is not only difficult, but probably impossible. Point 22 Thus, given the very nature of the business and the political process, much will depend on the promotion of certain norms or virtues on both sides of the principal agent relationship. Specifically, L. The DNI and CIA director should use their authority under the National Security Act of 1947 to expedite the clearance of personnel to meet mission needs and remove IC employees who have abused their positions of trust. An area of particular concern is that personnel under investigation for improprieties have been allowed to retire before internal investigations have been completed. Directors of both agencies must instill further confidence in their workforces, Congress, and the American people that they can and will deal effectively with personnel that fail to live up to their oath to the Constitution adhere to ethical and moral standards as expected by America's taxpayers, and faithfully execute the law. L. The President should direct the DNI and the Attorney General, by direction of the respective Inspectors General and IC Analytic Ombudsman, to conduct a further audit of all IC equities of past politicization and abuses of intelligence information. For example, a recent IC Ombudsman analysis during the 2020 election cycle noted, 
if our political leaders in the White House and Congress believe we are withholding intelligence because of organizational turf wars or political considerations, the legitimacy of the intelligence community's work is lost. 23. L. The President should immediately revoke the security clearances of any former directors, deputy directors, or other senior intelligence officials who discuss their work in the press or on social media without prior clearance from the current director. IC agencies, including the CIA, should minimize their public presence and vigorously investigate any and all leaks of information classified or otherwise. The ODNI and CIA should fire or refer for prosecution any employee who is suspected of leaking information, and penalties should include the removal of pension benefits for those who are found guilty. Additional tools are needed to prevent leaked intelligence from being used as a weapon in policy debates by IC leaders or decision makers in the executive branch or Congress. L. In addition, the Department of Justice should use all of the tools at its disposal to investigate leaks and should rescind damaging guidance by Attorney General Merrick Garland that limits investigators' ability to identify records of unauthorized disclosures of classified information to the media. Personnel have sufficient access to legitimate whistleblower claims under protections provided by inspectors general and Congress. The director and IC must prioritize hiring additional counterintelligence and security personnel to assist in this effort. L. Military and civilian IC training should include stronger emphasis on the norm of political neutrality including a mandatory course on professionalism and repercussions for abuse in the execution of duties in all degree programs at the National Intelligence University. L. Intelligence leaders need to model norms of neutrality and respect for the decision-making authority of the President, appointed officials, and Congress. This includes building trust with key decision-makers by not using their positions and privileged access to information to influence policymaking indirectly or directly in an inappropriate fashion, especially by engaging in threat inflation. IC leaders should practice extreme restraint in engaging with the public and the media. They should seek to work in the shadows rather than in the limelight. Potential restrictions on such appearances could supplement this norm, preventing political leaders from using IC officials to support an administration position as they do with military leaders. L. Retired IC leaders should similarly support the neutrality norm by not becoming public figures. L. Congress should not use IC leaders as pawns in policy struggles with the President or the other party during their appearances before committees of the House and Senate. While Congress has a proper oversight role, it should distinguish between information that needs to be public and information that should be discussed in private with members of the IC. A DNI should call balls and strikes to those on both sides of the aisle on Capitol Hill who attempt to weaponize the use of selective intelligence to feed political narratives. L. Political leaders should avoid manipulation by appointment, a practice by which intelligence leaders are selected for their policy views or political loyalties instead of their skilled expertise. Point 24 Presidents should also avoid public rebukes and pressure from the intelligence profession, which can include intimidation and bullying to shape IC analysis. This will be easier if IC leaders live by the norms of neutrality and thus are not seen as political actors, for whom political responses are deemed necessary. L. Intelligence leaders and professionals should never cook the books for presidents or change or shape their analysis to preserve access or status. Point 25. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. A future president should understand the importance of FISA 26 while also seeking reforms and accountability for any abuses of its authorities. When discussing FISA and what changes may need to be made, it is important to note and recognize that there are stark differences among the individual FISA authorities. Section 702 of FISA, for example, allows the IC to target foreign terrorists, spies, cyber hackers, and other bad actors, but only if they are non-U.S. persons, when their communications pass through the United States. While this authority may lapse if Congress does not resolve the issue by the end of 2023, Section 702 should be understood as an essential tool in the fight against terrorism malicious cyber actors, and Chinese espionage. These are two major national security priorities for an incoming president, and it is imperative that the need to use properly maintained and accountable authorities to counter these challenges be recognized. Section 702 is a vital program that often provides the lion's share of intelligence used in the president's daily brief, PDB, point 27 An independent review by the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, PCLOB, found that it was not abused. Nevertheless, Congress should review the PCLOB's upcoming 2023 report to help it determine whether any reforms or codification of recent administrative changes in FISA processes are needed. Other authorities in Title I and Title III, often referred to as traditional FISA, have elicited valid concerns about the politicization of intelligence collection authority in recent years. When seeking surveillance of Trump campaign adviser Carter Page, for example, the FBI and the Department of Justice concealed vital information from a specialized court and submitted applications that were riddled with errors. An incoming conservative president should consider reforms designed to prevent future partisan abuses of national security authority. A package of strong provisions to protect against such partisanship might include L. Stiffer penalties and mandatory investigations when intelligence leaks are aimed at domestic political targets. L. Tighter controls on otherwise lawful intercepts that also collect the communications of domestic political figures. 
L. An express prohibition on politically motivated use of intelligence authorities, and L. Reforms to improve the accountability of the Justice Department and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. To keep intelligence credentials from being used for partisan purposes, former high-ranking intelligence officials who retain a clearance should remain subject to the Hatch Act after they leave government to deter them from tying their political stance or activism to their continuing privilege of access to classified government information. The IC should be prohibited from monitoring so-called domestic disinformation. Such activity can easily slip into suppression of an opposition party's speech, is corrosive of First Amendment protections, and raises questions about impartiality when the IC chooses not to act. China focused changes, reforms, and resources. The term whole of government is all too frequently overused, but in responding to the generational threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party, that is exactly the approach that our national security apparatus should adopt. CIA Director William Burns has formally established a China mission center focused on these efforts, but it can be successful only if it is given the necessary personnel, cross-community collaboration, and resources. That is uncertain at this point, and just how seriously the organization is taking the staffing of the center is unclear. A critical strategic question for an incoming administration and IC leaders will be, how, when, and with whom do we share our classified intelligence? Understanding when to pass things to liaisons and for what purpose will be vital to outmaneuvering China in the intelligence sphere. Questions for a president will include. L. What is our overarching conception of the adversarial relationship and competition? L. How does intelligence sharing fit into that conception? Some members of Congress have said that intelligence relationships such as the 5EYES2H should be expanded to include other allies in the Asia-Pacific in, for example, A9I's framework. This fails to take into account the fact that any blanket expansion would necessarily involve protecting the sources and methods of a larger and quite possibly more diverse group of member countries that might or might not have congruent interests. That being said, however, a future conservative president should consider what resources and information sharing relationships could be included in an ad hoc or quasi-formal intelligence expansion, for example, with the Quad, among nations trying to counter the threat from China. Significant technology, language skills, and financial intelligence resources are needed to counter China's capabilities. Point 29 The IC was caught flat footed by the recent discovery of China's successful test of a nuclear capable hypersonic missile. No longer can America's information and technological dominance be assumed. China's gains and intense focus on emerging technologies have taken it in some areas from being a near peer competitor to probably being ahead of the United States. China's centralized government allocates endless resources sometimes inefficiently, to its strategic Made in China 2025 and military apparatuses, which combine government, military, and private sector activities on quantum information. Sciences and technologies, artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, biotechnologies, and advanced robotics. The IC must do more than understand these advancements, it must rally non-government and allied partners and inspire unified action to counter them. In addition, to combat China's economic espionage, authorities, and loopholes in the Foreign Agents Registration Act, FARA, 30 will have to be examined and addressed in conjunction with the Attorney General. Many issues within the broader government can be tied back to a more general congressional understanding of the threat due to the compartmentalization of committee jurisdictions and the responsibilities of executive agencies to brief on the nature of the threat. Broader committee jurisdictions should receive additional intelligence from IC agencies as necessary to inform China's unique and more comprehensive threat across layers of the U.S. government bureaucracy and economy. Former DNI John Ratcliffe increased the intelligence budget as it related to China by 20%. When people ask me why I did that, he explained in an interview, I say, because no one would let me increase it by 40%. I had an $85 billion combined annual budget for both the National Intelligence Program and Military Intelligence Program. My perspective was, whatever we're spending on countering China, it isn't enough. 31 From an intelligence standpoint, the need to understand Chinese motivations, capabilities, and intent will be of paramount importance to a future conservative president. It is therefore also of paramount importance that the whole of government be rowing together. National Counterintelligence and Security Center, NCSC The Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, SSCI, has taken a keen interest in possibly updating the codified language underpinning much of the nation's counterintelligence apparatus. Spy versus spy threats continue to exist, but the rise of China and, to an extent, Russia's machinations move beyond the governmental sphere to technological, economic, supply chain, cyber, academic, state, and local espionage threats at a level our country has never seen. The asymmetric threat includes cyber, non-traditional collection, and issues involving legitimate businesses. Serving as collection platforms. Barring statutory changes that could occur before 2025, a future conservative. President should further empower and resource the IC by executive order or through suggested changes in the Counterintelligence Enhancement Act, CEA 
of 2002.32 NCSC was given some authority for outreach efforts on behalf of the IC for counterintelligence education, insider threats, and broader U.S. government best practices, but there remain significant deltas between Title 50 and non-Title 50 entities' protections. Primary operational elements should remain at the FBI and CIA, with the Bureau and NCSC collaborating on non-governmental outreach. While there is no need to create a separate agency, a future president and DNI should amplify NCSC's authorities and roles with respect to counterintelligence strategy, policy, outreach, and governance, including supporting necessary joint duty assignments, JDA, for FBI and CIA personnel. At the same time, the FBI requires significant additional resources and legal authorities to fulfill its statutory role as the lead operational counterintelligence agency in dealing with the ever-growing threats posed by our adversaries. The CEA should be updated to include foreign espionage efforts aimed at universities. Corporate America, technology companies, research institutions, and academia must be willing, educated partners in this generational fight to protect our national security interests, economic interests, national sovereignty, and intellectual property. As well as the broader rules-based order all while avoiding the tendency to cave to the left-wing activists and investors who ignore the China threat and increasingly dominate the corporate world. Reinstitution of the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board and the National Security Business Alliance Council should be prioritized with leadership from the NCSC, the FBI, or a combination of both entities. When the CCP steals at least $400 billion $600 billion in intellectual property each year, it is time to devote some strategic thinking to exactly how and to what degree counterintelligence efforts can help to protect America's commercial endeavors. If Chinese strategic technology gains are happening almost entirely in transnational commercial space, for example, and the private sector is also gathering and analyzing some critical intelligence, these essential data points should assist in national-level counterintelligence efforts. The NCSC was created in the aftermath of 9-11 as the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, TTIC, which later became the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC, pursuant to President George W. Bush's Executive Order 13354.33 The NCTC was an organization of approximately three dozen detainees from across the U.S. government with a mandate to integrate counterterrorism intelligence and missions, including terrorist screening. Eventually, in November 2014 the Director of National Intelligence, DNI, established NCSC by combining the Office of the National Counterintelligence Executive with the Center for Security Evaluation, the Special Security Center and the National Insider Threat Task Force to effectively integrate and align counterintelligence and security mission areas under a single organizational construct. The director of NCSC serves in support of the DNI's role as security executive agent, SECEA, to develop, implement, oversee, and integrate personnel security initiatives throughout the U.S. government.34. NCSC has added value in such areas as fusing cross-community intelligence for terrorism watch listing purposes and improving information sharing while carrying roughly half of the overall cotter for the ODNI. An incoming administration should focus NCTC on integrative tasks, many of which cannot be carried out elsewhere in the IC, but should not use personnel and resources for redundant analyses that duplicate the work of such other IC entities as the FBI and CIA. Additional areas for reform. Analytical integrity. The tradecraft of intelligence analysis is mostly a collection of lessons learned over decades about what works and does not work in a profession whose high-stakes work is performed by thousands but that also bears little outside scrutiny and provides few metrics by which to gauge success or failure on a regular basis. These lessons have accumulated from L. The perceived misuse of intelligence by consumers as was the case with respect to war-related assessments in the Johnson and Bush administrations. L. Failures such as the failures to warn of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the specific threat of 9-11. L. Successes in piecing together tactical and often technical puzzles such as estimates of Iranian nuclear program maturation, and L. Strategic victories such as anticipating critical geopolitical developments that have been years in the making. Historically, this tradecraft has been passed on in the form of unwritten rules learned on the job and in agency-specific training classes, but increasingly since the intelligence reforms of 2004, they have been codified IC-wide under the direction of the Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Mission Integration. A RAN study of U.S. intelligence tradecraft notes that the vast majority of intelligence analysts reside outside the Central Intelligence Agency and do work that is tactical, operational, and current. 35 The study goes on to note that the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, has as many analysts as the CIA has and that the National Security Agency, NSA, has several times as many analysts, as does the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NA, indicating both the breadth of the IC's technical collection and its emphasis both on developing analysts who can interpret secret human or technical intelligence in quick turnaround pieces and on countering tactical, asymmetric threats like terrorism. During the Cold War, however, there was a more balanced analytic focus with greater emphasis on strategic intelligence issues as a means of outcompeting the Soviet Union. This kind of analysis deals not only in secrets, but also in mysteries. 
making well-founded but ultimately unknowable predictions about future actions by a competitor or adversary. The tradecraft necessary to succeed in strategic analysis requires substantive regional and topical expertise developed over the years to supplement experience in the daily collection and understanding of secrets. Institutionally, it also requires that agencies' analytic processes be open to discussion, debate, and dissent because analysts must work together to describe a probable range of future outcomes and warn about unproven current threats rather than using the collection to solve a single puzzle with a definitive answer. Regarding its mission to follow longer-term issues, the IC is falling short in resourcing and in openness to dissenting opinions, which, if taken seriously, can help responsible officials respond more effectively to threats and threat actors. The IC analytic ombudsman has expressed concern that hyperpartisanship has threatened to undermine the foundations of our republic, penetrating even into the intelligence community 36. For example, the ombudsman noted in a report on the IC's handling of election threat analysis in 2020 that, in his view, CIA officials had deliberately downplayed dissenting views and coordination comments expressed by experts at the National Intelligence Council and elsewhere who felt there was evidence of Beijing's intent to exert at least some influence on the 2020 election as opposed to the consensus view that Beijing did not interfere in U.S. elections. Senior CIA analysts and leaders made it difficult to have a healthy analytic conversation in a confrontational environment while violating multiple official IC tradecraft standards. By not allowing dissents or considering alternatives, the CIA exercised undue influence on intelligence 37 subsequent exposure of China linked online influence and the FBI's warnings about continued efforts through the 2022 midterms highlight the folly of undue certainty without consideration of alternatives on election influence and other controversial issues such as the origin of COVID-19 analysts at the most powerful intelligence agencies have increasingly tended to use the leeway they have been given to insert their political views into their work in order to influence if possibly even control the analytic process they do this in ways that attempt to squash dissent and impair the creation of a culture in which entrenched views are challenged and unpopular analytical lines can survive. Or not according to their merits. To help the United States and its leaders to outcompete China across multifaceted societal, economic, military, and technological threats, the IC's capability to conduct strategic intelligence analysis that is relevant to policymakers in both parties must be rebuilt and strengthened. Because Beijing may be a peer or even exceed U.S. capabilities in some areas, the post-9-11 analytic focus on quick turnaround secrets is not good enough. Strategic planning informed by intelligence must take place for the United States to stay ahead of whatever new threats China may pose. An incoming conservative president will have the opportunity to signal the demand for such strategic products and prioritize their production through communications to intelligence leaders and formal mechanisms such as shifting priorities within the national intelligence priority framework and structuring the president's daily brief. The incoming DNI should also emphasize implementing the recommendations in the Ombudsman's report especially regarding objectivity, the inclusion of dissenting viewpoints, and more serious efforts to hold senior leaders accountable for backchannel attempts to change or suppress analytic views. Accounting for the long history of intelligence failures and surprises, an incoming conservative president must appreciate the ambiguity, complexity, limits, and assumptions inherent in intelligence assessments. Intelligence often deals with the human dimension in complex decision systems within a foreign country or organization. And this makes consistently accurate predictions difficult if not impossible to develop. Seeing something and understanding what you are seeing are two different things, so a president should consistently and patiently press the IC about its potential biases, assumptions, methodology, and sourcing. With regard to election threat analysis and politically controversial topics, agency leaders should take seriously the ombudsman's admonition that we need to maintain tradecraft standards across all countries and topics by ensuring that equitable standards apply across all foreign threat actors. Analysis should be put forward without regard to the domestic political ramifications of intelligence conclusions. Obligation to share and real-time auditing capability. The federal government has made admirable progress in recent years by being more forward-leaning in sharing cyber threat intelligence with private sector partners and the public, emphasizing that the protective nature of such information is of value only if put into the right hands at the right time. Since critical infrastructure and services are overwhelmingly owned, managed, and defended by the private sector in the United States, there has been an increasing emphasis on declassifying intelligence and sharing actionable information with private sector partners often through industry-specific information sharing and analysis centers, ISICs, regional meetings of government and private sector experts called InfraGuard, run by the FBI, direct public notification from the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and, increasingly, the NSA, and more discreet one-on-one -on -one engagements led by the collecting agencies. These programs properly recognize the private sector's role in providing cybersecurity. For Americans, in practice, however, the intelligence shared by the U.S. government through these venues is too often already known or no longer relevant by the time it makes its way through the downgrade process for sharing. In addition, government-shared information often needs to take advantage of the opportunity to provide contexts, 
such as attribution, trends, and size of the observed cyber problem. As warranted, additional context should be provided to the private sector as a matter of routine. To continue improving the U.S. government's ability to defend the country's most vital networks, the IC must adopt an obligation to share policy process, including the capacity for right to release intelligence products whereby newly discovered technical indicators, targeting, and other intelligence relevant to cyber defense are automatically provided either to the public or to targeted entities within 48 hours of their collection which is how counterterrorism intelligence has been managed for years when it comes to a duty to warn. Under this policy, agency heads should still have the flexibility to withhold intelligence for operational or counterintelligence reasons but would need to report regularly to Congress on the number of and justification for exceptions. This policy would make sharing intelligence and defending networks the default, as it already is in the rest of the cybersecurity community outside the IC to improve the quantity, relevance, and timeliness of defensive information while ensuring accountability for top leaders when they must withhold this information. One of the most significant challenges within the IC is presented by the need to share information promptly among the 18 elements of the intelligence enterprise. The only long-term solution to the understandable tension between the need to share information and the need to protect intelligence sources and methods is a robust real-time auditing capability that electronically flags unauthorized access. Under an identity management system with real-time audit, even the most sensitive, Information acquired by America's intelligence agencies can be shared, and the access to and use of that information are appropriately monitored. Establishing A real-time auditing capability is essential to decreasing the risk for the heads of intelligence agencies in meeting their statutory requirements to ensure that they protect sources and methods associated with the classified information their agencies collect. Overclassification There is broad consensus across the U.S. government and among stakeholders that the system for classifying, declassifying, and otherwise marking and handling sensitive information is at a crossroads. Exorbitant amounts of classified data are created daily, and agency personnel often mistakenly choose classification as the default selection to ensure national security. At the same time, the effectiveness of downgraded and carefully declassified information to support foreign policy efforts has been borne out in, for example, alerting the broader world of Russia's buildup and likely plans for its invasion of Ukraine. Two executive orders principally govern how the U.S. government handles classified and sensitive information. L. Executive Order 13526, Classified National Security Information, issued in 2938 prescribes the classification levels and procedures for declassification. L. Executive Order 13556, Controlled Unclassified Information, issued in 201039 aimed to establish a uniform program for managing all unclassified information that requires safeguarding or dissemination controls. The current system for declassifying classified national security information, CNSI, is extraordinarily analog, requiring experts' review of individual records. Declassification policies are based on human review of paper and need to contemplate and handle the proliferation and volume of digital records created by agencies. The U.S. government will soon reach the point at which manual review is impossible. The declassification of CNSI should support key U.S. national security objectives, reflect mission priorities, and not serve solely as a necessary procedural function. Reforms should include L. Tighter definitions and greater specificity for categories of information requiring protection. L. More stringent policies to effect significant reductions in the number of original classification authorities, OCAS. L. Stricter accountability measures at the OCA level and more detailed security classification guides. L. Enhanced metrics for accuracy of classification. L. A general simplification of the overall system for the benefit of users. On the back end, an ODNI run declassification process that is faster, nimbler, default to automated, and larger scale should be a priority. Additionally, investments in IT are required to deal with the growing volumes of CNSI collected and produced in the digital age, along with many years' worth of existing analog and digital holdings that could provide valuable historical insights. An incoming administration needs to explore options to prioritize funding for innovation in declassification management, for example, by establishing a budget line item specifically for the modernization of declassification or designating funding for program classification management as a special interest item. The administration will also need to transition to using technology, including tools and services for managing big data, which provide a robust electronic record repository, making information within and across agencies easier to organize and locate and facilitating more rapid review and release capabilities for records of emerging interest, artificial intelligence slash machine learning, which, when incorporated into existing business practices, enables machine interpretation of unstructured text and data, applies decision support technology to enable more consistent classification decisions, and expedites reviews between agencies, an expansion of commercial cloud services, which facilitate the rapid testing and deployment of new tools and technologies. However, technology is not a panacea, human expertise in information holdings and routine validation of the technology will always be necessary. With or without machine assistance, 
agencies will require more people and more varied skill sets to improve their ability to meet the electronic records era's classification and declassification demands and serve an incoming administration's goals. Broader U.S. government and IC intelligence needs. Increasingly, conflicts. Among U.S. adversaries such as China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are conducted in the realms of technology and finance. Point 40 This challenge requires new tools, authorities, and technological expertise across the U.S. government, particularly at the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security, BIS, and the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, CFIUS, which is housed at the Treasury Department. An incoming conservative president should task his DNI and Secretary of Commerce with increasing coordination, the resources needed for BIS and SCIF capacity, and proper and necessary intelligence sharing to counter the activities of multifaceted adversaries such as China. This would include additional work with private sector expertise, granting clearances to niche sector experts and United States citizen commercial and financial partners as needed. Cover in the digital age. Even in the public domain, it is becoming increasingly clear that protecting the identities of undercover intelligence officers is difficult in the digital age. Point 41 The truth is that as our daily activities are conducted predominantly in the digital domain, our antiquated system for providing cover to undercover officers has lagged woefully behind the threat from foreign adversaries. The DIA, CIA, and FBI are increasingly aware of this threat and are devoting resources to the problem. Their back office infrastructure, however, is such that they are still using methods for providing cover from decades past that put valuable intelligence officers at unnecessary risk. How intelligence officers and their families are taught to use smartphones and social media, travel, conduct banking, and take and share pictures even how and when they are paid can make it difficult to protect identities. Point 42 Legends, fake backstories, and identities are often weak, incomplete, and unable to stand up to a basic Google search. Point 43 Officers operating under non-official cover are offered even less protection and training to help them succeed. In addition, ubiquitous technical surveillance, UTS, techniques being refined by technologies emanating from the regimes in China and Russia will continue to be highly challenging for intelligence officers. An incoming administration will need to double down on resourcing and training so that members of the IC will have the expertise they need to operate clandestinely, and successfully, against hard targets. Privacy Shield For many years, the European Union, EU, has tried to force US companies operating in Europe to follow its data privacy regulations. Misleading claims in the 2013 Snowden leaks destroyed the initial Safe Harbor Framework 44 that allowed American companies to transfer data across the Atlantic, its successor. The Privacy Shield Framework 45 was struck down by European courts on the grounds that it provides insufficient protections for EU citizens against hypothetical U.S. government surveillance. Those same European courts exempted the intelligence services of EU member states from the standards applied to the U.S., suggesting that trade protectionism may be the real motive behind data privacy regulations. In 2022, the Biden administration negotiated a new agreement, the Transatlantic Data Privacy Framework 46 intended to withstand European legal challenges. Given the fate of its predecessors, it is not certain that it will survive. Executive Order 14086, Enhancing Safeguards for United States Signals Intelligence Activities. 47 implements this new framework by attempting to align signals intelligence collection practices with European privacy regulations. At most, the executive order's changes will be helpful support for the framework in future European litigation, at worst, they could throw sand in the gears of important intelligence programs. An incoming conservative president should reset Europe's expectations. Brussels has always arbitraged the difference between being a military ally against, for example, Russia, and conducting a full-blown trade conflict with the United States. Restrictions on data exports have been part of the trade conflict, but now they could seriously harm our military and intelligence capabilities. Moreover, restrictions on U.S. intelligence collection hurt the Europeans themselves, especially as the United States shares unprecedented amounts of intelligence on Russia's invasion of Ukraine with Europeans. 48. Europe is telling the United States to meet intelligence oversight standards that no European country meets.